This programme features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. Good morning, good morning everybody and welcome to, well, what can be described as a very damp, very wet Juma Game Reserve. It has rained non-stop since yesterday afternoon. I don't think there has been a break the entire night. And so it is incredibly wet out here. And hopefully it's not going to be too wet for much longer. Hopefully it'll dry out a little bit during the course of the morning. Now, my name is Tristan. On camera today I've got Viam. There we go. Thumb up. So Viam and I are going to try and see if we can find ourselves something to look at because we're not really sure what's going on. What we thought what we'll do is we'll do kind of a tour around all the dams, see how all of our dams have filled up during the course of the night it should have filled up a lot given the amount of rain that we've had so we will do that and we'll try and follow up on Tundi as well and see how that's going to go there's also going to be Byron and Ali in the tent which should be shenanigans I'm sure the two of them are also a laugh together so that should be quite fun and it's obviously going to be interactive all of it so you'll be able to ask lots of questions and participate in the shenanigans and you can do that on hashtag safari live on Twitter or on the YouTube chat so that's the plan for the morning. Let's see how we go. It's still raining. It's still wet. So we thought because it's still raining and still wet, a lot of the roads are closed. No off-roading as well, unfortunately, for the morning because of the amount of rain that has fallen. So we have a situation where hopefully we're going to be lucky and find something on the road because otherwise it's going to be really tough to be able to see what we're doing. They, we do the snow off-roading sometimes because of, you know, when the rain falls everything gets quite soft and then you leave these massive ruts all over the place and you damage the top sort of layer of the soil and so we try and stay off it. There might be a few places on some of the crests where we could potentially do it but definitely towards drainage lines and on the sort of more cotton, black cotton type soils, we're definitely not going to be able to do much of that and, and like I say some of the roads unfortunately are also going to be down. So. We'll just have to try and kind of weave our way through all of those roads that are closed. The good news is that there seems to be a bit of light coming through from the eastern side, which means that hopefully the sun's going to come out. The rain seems to be slowly but surely kind of easing up. It doesn't seem as though it's falling nearly as heavily as it did last night. Last night it really came down and like I say, through the course of the night it just kept raining all the way. It hasn't stopped at all. So. There is still a bit falling but it's not nearly as serious as it was yesterday and so hopefully it will stop fairly shortly and we'll have a nice dry morning and then one of them, one of Ali or Byron in the tent will come out and join me out here to see what we can find. But for now it's a blank canvas, we are the only vehicle that is on Juma or anywhere in this sort of Juma Bufelzuk Torchwood area and so it's going to be interesting to see whether we find some things. So. Angel Girl, are you wondering if I drew the short straw to be out in the rain? So no, I didn't draw the short straw, it was voluntary and the reason why is because Ali braved out the rain last night so she was the one that stayed out while the two boys messed around in the tent. What was that that just flew there? There's some sort of bird that was flying very with much difficulty is probably the best way to describe it. It was landed somewhere in that knobthorn, but I don't know where it's gone, but oh, there it is. It's just hopping about in there. Can't actually see what it is. We've just got the spotlight, so it's difficult to make out exactly what it is. Maybe it looks like a female redback strike. Um, but so Ali did the, you know, she really kind of toughed it out last night. Byron was actually scheduled to be on walk or tent this morning, so we just kept that. And he also got very, very wet yesterday afternoon, as we all did, but just, yeah, man, it was just how it worked out, and it's okay to be out and about. Like I say, it's not raining too hard now. It was raining much harder when we first got down to work, and it actually seems like it's easing off quite nicely. So if the sun does break through those clouds, it's going to be a magnificently beautiful morning because everything is going to be clean and fresh, and it's going to be very pretty. Now, there's some vultures up here, but I don't know if we're going to get these on camera, are we, Vildi? If we reverse, you reckon? Okay. Problem is, I've got a tree that might be in the way, so I'll try and go as far as I can. Can you get those, Vildi, or not? Uh, so, a little bit. There you can see the bottom of a vulture. Unfortunately, our roof, our roof is in the way, and then if I go any further, the terminalia gets in the way. So, best visuals of a vulture I'm sure you've ever seen. 
But yes, the two whiteback vultures sitting in the tree, getting themselves nice and wet, and they're going to be down for probably most of the day. I don't think they're going to be flying too far. They're going to be trying to dry themselves out. Wouldn't be surprised if the sun comes out, we come past here, both of them are sitting with their wings out, just trying to dry everything. Ah, now... Oh, hang on a second. You know what is going to happen today? It's going to be bullfrog day. So there's, there should be bullfrogs here. There, there's one there. So we should get lots of bullfrogs out and about. So there's one of our African bullfrogs. And we last time we had rain like this, we had wrestling bullfrogs. And Jamie did a whole segment on the WWE wrestling tournament that was going on here on Juma with the frogs. And so I wonder if we're going to have that action this morning or if it's going to maybe be this evening when these guys really start to kind of mate and go a bit crazy but there certainly should be a few of these around which is really very cool to see so i'm sure lots of bullfrogs will be about and maybe some other frogs too it's going to be the best thing because we're going to hear all the frogs this evening it's going to be wonderful to be in a vehicle this evening and driving around right like i said i'm not the only one out here the two I wanted to say clowns, but they're not clowns, they are just fun people, are sitting in the tent and, well, they're ready to entertain you. So let's send you across so they can say good morning. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the tent. My name is Byron and... I'm Ali. <laughs> and on camera today with us is the unfortunate Ferg. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. oh, so I think we've got quite an interesting uh, tent planned for you today. I think we're going to try and have some fun giving the weather conditions. It, uh, it's been sure wonderful. We'll yeah, it's been wonderful rain and um, it's always, always very welcome. But um, speaking of welcome, we need to welcome Ellie to the tent. First time to the tent, eh, yeah. Ellie? I don't know how I managed to survive so long with her sure. coming into the tent. That's awesome. That's <laughs> awesome. So there are a number of ground rules. I don't know if James has emailed them to you. But, Not yet, uh, but you can tell me all about them. We'll, we'll go through the show and we'll give Ellie the ground rules. James's <laughs> tent ground rules. <laughs> <laughs> don't touch my stuff. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Don't touch James's stuff. Um, so, I think um, what we've decided to try and do this morning is have a bit of fun in the tent. Yes. And um, now, I don't know, I think I'm at a bit of a disadvantage here because Alan... Uh, Alan. Who's Alan? <laughs> <laughs> this is far too early. <laughs> Ali's South American roots might help her with this. So, what we're going to do is we would like our viewers to... Send us the name, a random name of an animal we get here in Juma. I think let's make it a bit easier. Yeah. So an animal we get here on Juma, and um, we need to come up with the on, scientific name. Okay, yeah. Yes. You were missing the important part. Yes. <laughs> no, no. We need to come up with the scientific name, and then the competition is we need to write it down and see who can spell it correctly. Um, we will try and find a bunch of insects around during the, the morning while we can, <laughs> but, uh, but that is going to be our main aim for today. And then later we're going to change it around and you give us the scientific name and we and need we to see if we can animal. guess the name of the animal. I think you might, it might not be that bad because the scientific names are going to be pronounced in English. Yeah. <laughs> so that's, that's where the tricky part is going to come for me. <laughs> so, so it could be interesting. It could be interesting. So don't forget, hashtag Safari Live. Send us your, send us your, um, your words, uh, your animal names, names. And, then, um, and then we shall try our best. We have pen. We'll try and write them down. And we have paper. Ding green. All right, so our first one is from FC, and it is? Elephant. Elephant, Sorry, okay. I didn't know if you were asking. Do you know the scientific name of the I elephant? I do. Do you? <laughs> <laughs> of course I do. Of course I do. Go ahead, Ali. Go ahead. <laughs> do I need to say it, or do I need to write it in the first round? Well, you say it, and then, uh, and then we need to write it. Loxodonta africana, as yeah. you would say it with the English accent, Ex I believe. Exactly. Was that good enough? That was very, very good. Thank you, would Byron. you like a book to press on? That Any would or? be wonderful. Um, there, uh, I will take very good care of your book. Please look after my books. I will. Just going right. to use the back. Okay. Please do not copy me. Let's see if we can get our first one right. All right. One, two, three, go. Okay. I want to see Byron. Are you copying me? Oh, we have the 
same. Did yeah. we have the same? Let's see. Is that? Uh, can you get that, Ferg? Sorry. Loxo Donto Africana. Exactly the same. One point each. Yes. Well done. Well done. Well done. <coughs> We might survive. All right. So, um, so that's, that's the idea of the game this morning. We're going to try to do that for a little bit. Have a bit of fun with it. Um, I'm sure we're going to be laughing a lot at our spelling. <laughs> Please excuse the handwriting. Um, for both of us. For both of us. <laughs> but I, I believe it's a sign of intelligence. Or, I like that, yeah. Or, or that's what I... <laughs> Messy writers are more intelligent. Bad handwriting <laughs> is apparently a sign of intelligence. Bad spelling is Anyway, let's go back across to Brave Tristan who's out in the rain. He's probably going to have to stick to one road because it's so wet. <laughs> but let's see what his plan is for the morning. Well, Byron, I tell you what, is, being out here is actually not that bad. Look at the color that we've got this morning. It is amazing. The sun is kind of being filtered through the clouds and it is this orange weird hue that's being cast on everything so it's not something wrong with the camera it's not in sepia or anything like that it's just literally the sun is creating this insane orange color and what is that in the road there it looks like a lion or a leopard that's just crossed the road hold on i think so or a water buck one of the three you vote water buck for the i think you might be right but let's just double check because you never know it kind of had a liney strut to it, but waterbuck do have that liney strut, and in this dim light, it could very well be a waterbuck. Here's your favorite emerald spotted wood dove, uh, Viam. Viam, oh, have you made friends now, Viam? Viam and uh, had a war with an emerald spotted wood dove at camp, and apparently they've now made friends. So let's see how that goes. Now, Viam, definitely not leopard, I don't think, but it could be a. I think waterbuck is correct, Viam. Where did it go? Hmm. I don't know where it went. It must have crossed somewhere here. Are oh, these tracks here? Here's tracks. Yes, a water buck. Well done, Viam. That's well done. But the light is insane. It just looks weird because, you know, it looks as though there's something going on with the camera. But it was a water buck. I can see its tracks bounding off into the long grass so not a lion but that's okay we'll hopefully find something somewhere i wanted to see something like a lion or a leopard or anything actually in this light it's just so ridiculous that it would be just cool to see something and see how weird it looks and funky maybe janet jackson actually janet jackson's right here colbert you say i broke the sun you want your money back okay Sorry, I didn't mean to break the sun, but anyway, I, you know, at least it's at least it's something different. I feel like actually this I'm enhancing the experience. I'm giving you something that is different, which should be rarer and therefore more expensive. What do you think, Kirst? Do I have to pay back the money, or do I do I get to repin more? Uh, exactly. I also think I deserve the money. I think it's uh, a rare occurrence. I think we. We do deserve money, that's for sure. Oh, no tail today. I was hoping that Janet Jackson would be home in this cool light, but Janet Jackson seems not to be there. And the problem with this is that if I go towards the hole, VM's going to have the view of the side of our roof and very little else. And so I can try and see if I can maybe do a little kind of maneuvering here just to get a little bit more of an angle. Can we? No. Hold on, Viam. Let me just use. A, I'm gonna have to use a spotlight because it's still so dark. No, nothing in there. Nothing in there. So no Janet Jackson this morning. It's all quiet on the Janet Jackson home front. Right. Now I'm gonna carry on down towards Twin Dams and towards where Tandy was yesterday. And while I do that. I believe I must send you across to the Game Masters, which I'm pretty sure are more like ringmasters in a circus. But anyway, let's see what they're up to. Ringmasters in a circus. How dare he? <laughs> <laughs> That's very rude, Tristan. It's very rude. Oh, uh, well. Um, we did step out to appreciate this wonderful light that Tristan also had. It seems to have disappeared slightly now behind us. So it didn't work out quite as well as we thought it would. But it is still a bit of a bit yeah. of colour, that bit of getting there. Orangey, yellow. What else have you got? <laughs> yeah, 
orangey yellow color in the sky. Citrusy. Yeah, very beautiful. The rain yeah. seems to have subsided slightly, still drizzling a little bit. Depends where you look at though, because that's very pretty, but the fact that it's going away might be an indication of what's about to yeah. come our way, which is not that pretty still. So There seems to be a little rainbow, rainbow over there. Can you see it first? Are we able to get that? Slightly, a very slight rainbow over there, but it is still very cloudy behind us. So um, we are going to return back to the tent. All right, we've got the first word. Whew. Oh. oh, no. <laughs> I think I know half of it. <laughs> Where's my little paper? There we go. There we go. Um, so our next name that has been sent to us was by... Did you catch the No, sentence? sorry, I didn't... Alpine Wolf. Alpine Wolf. Girl. 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 Sorry. <laughs> you hungry? <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I, I didn't hear that correctly. Um, thanks, Kirst. And um, that... The word that was sent to us is African wildcat. <laughs> <laughs> I got the first word. African wildcat. I, um, um, I don't know what African wildcat is, a scientific name actually. Feline? Felidae? It's part of the Felidae family, but. Um, no, I only got the first word is Felis. Felis. Oh, okay. But the second part, the Fellas. second part, I can't remember it. Um, so we, the uh, clue from Cursed is that it is a Looney Tune, Looney Tunes ca character's cat's name. Cat's name, yeah, yeah, cat's name in Looney Tunes. You see, this is where the English comes against me. <laughs> Felis, um, Felis Felix. Felix, yeah, I wonder. Is that right? Uh, uh, Sylvester. Okay. Uh, oh dear. So close. Felis Sylvestris. Okay. A third word. Oh. Then I'm going to add Sylvestris in. A third in word. Sylvestris, Sylvestris. Maybe it's a subspecies. Is that Sylvestris, Sylvestris. Probably subspecies. Yeah. I would say. Okay. Um. Sylvestris. I feel like if it's I'm a drawing competition, space, I'm so going to I'm what I've done is I've done Felis Sylvestris squared. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so Felis Sylvestris. How did oh, you spell it? I spelled it with an I. I don't even know. Sylvestris. Did Ellie get it right? Yes. B? I'll, I'll tell you what we're going to do. Let's have a look at it so we can. Sorry, we that struggling is to hear cursed um, a little bit. African spelling. wild cat. Maybe it's S Y. Uh, let's just have a look here. African wolf, no wild no, dog. No, not quite. Why is there no wild cat? Maybe it's under cat. Don't I have the other mammals book? Hmm. Um, Sorry, I want to make sure. Yeah, it's not... Uh, well, while you look, let, let us tell you a little bit about the African wildcats. We don't see them here all that often, although we are pretty sure that they live here in Juma. I actually went tracking with Herbie the one time and we came across their tracks right in the far eastern corner, actually not too far from Chitakatla and Bufalzuk boundary, just in that little corner there. And it seemed that it had eaten a little scrub here. Now, we do know that they are around, but because they are small-ish small, small -ish cats, they are bigger than a house cat. The grass all around us, especially during the summertime, just hides them very well. And also they go on trees quite a bit so they're very tough to see i think perhaps places like the kalahari desert are a lot easier to see them that's where i've seen them i don't know what about yeah, you 100 percent right i was, um the last african wildcat sighting i had was in the in the kalahari mm -hmm. um an interesting one because um well we get meerkats in the in the kalahari which we don't get in this area and these meerkats run around and forage during the day and we watched the family and they ran to a bush and they all seemed very alarmed. And we thought it might be a snake because they okay. do tend to mob snakes. And it was an African wildcat with her kitten hidden in a bush. And these meerkats so actually mobbed and chased them away, which I thought was, uh, was fascinating yeah. because wildcats, I know, will sometimes hunt meerkats. Yeah. 
But um, this family of meerkat managed to chase the wild cats well away. Well done. Was, was how amazing. big was the kitten? Was it tiny? Or? The kitten was quite small. The kitten was about this big. Now, the African wild cat is only about yeah. this big. But they got long legs. They've yeah. got fairly long legs compared to a, to a house cat. But house the kitten cat. was only, only about that big. Maybe that's the reason why it was protecting the little one. Maybe. And meerkat can so. be fierce. So yeah. I, if all those screaming things come running at you, I would run away. Exactly, yes. <laughs> yeah. They, they, are, um, they are quite ferocious. So I have the African wildcat in front of me, and it is Felis sylvestris. That is it. So S I L V E S T R I S. There we go. Uh, we got that. There we go. Felis sylvestris. Did you get it right? Did you Libica. get it wrong? I got half of it right. Just the sub. Uh, Libica group? No, you got it right. Lib Libica group. Ali got a point. Ali is one ahead. And that is the beautiful African wildcat. Stunning creature. Yeah, I haven't seen um, in this area before. Um, but in the Timbavati, I have seen. Have you? So maybe drier mm. conditions. They prefer yeah. drier conditions. Um, mm. Anyway, well, well done, Ali. Thank you. Um, I only got half of it right, so. I'm, I'm not <laughs> upset at all. Um, but let's go back to Tristan and see what he's doing. <laughs> Well, Byron, don't be upset. It's just how it goes. Ali did study Latin, so you're in for a bit of trouble there. Now, we are sitting down at Twin Dams, and the reason I'm sitting here is because there is an absolute cacophony of frog sounds, and so it is amazing. So I'm going to stop talking for a little bit, and just so you can hear what's going on, and then I'll tell you exactly which frogs are calling, but it is amazing. Right, so we currently have five different frog species that are busy calling here at the moment. So I'm going to go through each one and show you exactly which ones there are. So we'll start with, I'm just trying to find the first one. This is the one that's the loudest that you are hearing, that whirring sound is the banded rubber frog. It's a pretty funky looking fella and that's because it displays aposomatic coloration because it is toxic. So it secretes a fluid that is toxic and is not very good for you. So I'll play its call so you can just isolate each call and you'll know which one is which. So that's the whirring sound that we were hearing. Right, so that's the banded rubber. The next one that we've got in this area is an ornate frog. So they're quite pretty little things actually. Tough to see them though. I find that they're very difficult to actually locate. But it's very cool little frogs and they have a very cool call as well. They're further down. It sounds like they're in Little Gauri at Baboon Pan. But they've got this sound. <coughs> So that's the ornate frog. Then we've got the, oh, who have we got next? We've got African bullfrog next. So they're the low ones that are in the, sort of providing the base for this ensemble. And the last one we have is a tremolo sand frog, which goes along the lines of this. So that's what the tremolo sand frog looks like. He's got a bit of a stumpy face, doesn't he? And almost little dermal dots, much like what you see on a toad, but they are part of the frog. So it's a, it looks like Hosanna. No, Hosanna is much prettier than that for you. <laughs> so that's the tremolo sand frog that we've also got out this morning, which is making the higher click sounds. So five different species of frog all in one place. It's absolutely phenomenal to hear them. Caesar, you want to know if, <laughs> if we all eat frog legs in South Africa? Um, only on Tuesdays. So Tuesdays is frog leg day and you've got to pay attention for the specials that come out. Often you go to restaurants and you can get a really good leg on a Wednesday, but mostly on Tuesdays. We find that they're much fresher on a Tuesday. They like to go harvesting on a Monday before, you know, they get, before the sort of pans dry up and those kind of things. So Tuesday is frog leg day, and they do all kinds of different styles of frog legs. They do deep fried, 
deep fried with sour cream is one of them yep that's definitely a firm favorite for many a South African there's also a grilled with uh, sweet chili and, and cream cheese um, yes and if you're being very naughty and you you are not uh, you are you know wanting to spoil yourself then you'll you'll sometimes take your valentine for a bit of chocolate dipped frog's eggs Kirsty do you like chocolate dipped frog's eggs I mean frog's uh, legs not eggs eh, legs with the frog's eggs on top love them yes I have caramel frog legs as well yes they are they are a treat aren't they just like caramel treat is anyway so no we don't actually eat frog legs yeah I mean they the whole frog is eaten by some cultures particularly bull and in fact they are caught using a certain type of tree which I'll try and find for you and show you exactly what I'm talking about so they do use a certain type of tree to catch them and um, bullfrogs are eaten the whole bullfrog though not just the legs and those are those big giant bullfrogs not the African bullfrog like we have here although the African bullfrog is also fed upon in this area so you know it can be eaten but generally South Africans don't really eat frog legs it's not a huge part that's left to our northern hemisphere counterparts in a little country called France right I'm going to carry on see if I can find any sign of Tandy she apparently was in this area yesterday Tingana was also in this area oh there's a frog that's busy calling on my phone so we'll have to stop that enough enough knocking sand frog we don't need you anyway while I kind of think about it, I'm going to send you back across to the mischief that is the tent this morning. I'm a bit offended by his kind of work. He's called us a circus. He's called us a mischief. Oh, no. Can you not hear Ali? Can you hear me? I can hear you fine. Yeah. Oh, dear, Ali. What's, going, what's happening to me? Okay, well, um, yeah, Ali was <laughs> she's upset with Tristan calling us mischievous in the tent. Um, right. But um, I loved hearing those frogs. That was yeah, fascinating. That was Wonderful different uh, frogs there. We can hear the banded rubber frogs all around us at the moment. They are mm -hmm. calling. There's a cacophony of banded rubber frogs. So a lot of big words for the morning. <laughs> I apologize. I don't know what happened. Just throw in some Latin in there and then we're sorted yeah. for the day. Our brains will be finished. Oh, oh. blackback jackal is our next Latin word. From uh, Gemma, Gemma. Blackback Jackal. Um, I got nothing. Oh, yeah. I got one word. Uh, oh, no. I don't know. I don't know what. I'm just throwing in family names now. <laughs> it's going to be one of those obvious ones, that ones that we hear, and we're going to be yeah. like, ah, how could we not remember I this cannot, one? I cannot remember Blackback Jackal, a scientific name. See, we don't use scientific names of animals, and it's bad. Yeah. We forget. It's terrible. I think we we, we tend to use them more for plants, just because yeah. there seems to be a lot more variation amongst plants. So if you call this thing a bush willow, then it can be many of them. But then if you give more specific scientific name, there can only be one. Exactly. I suppose it's the same with animals. I'm just yeah. There's just not such custom of of using. Yeah, I think there's uh, often within South Africa too, with our many different languages. Um, a certain tree, for example, may be called Something or may different. have four different common names, but that's where the scientific name is very important. So we can always tell our guests it is called a combretum in Berber, which is a lead word. There's no other, there's yeah. no other word yeah, for it. Only, um, okay, what is the Latin I've word I've only for? got canis. Is that, is that if... Mesomelis. Is that what Kirst said? Let's Canis see. mesomelis. Oh dear. Okay. That was it. definitely not something I expected. I want to, to lie and pretend that I knew the the second part, but I think it's just I didn't really. Right, I am ready. These markers also they don't hide it if we make mistakes, hey? They're very bright. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, let's see. Canis mesomelis. I think you probably got it wrong. Right. Sorry. I think you spelled it the same. Oh. No. Oh, that was that was just luck. It's, oh, with an A. I can't <laughs> believe it. It was a dream. I thought you would have gotten it right with the U. Yeah. Oh, well, this was just Ellie. luck. <laughs> just luck. This so, this one I can't claim really. Mesomelis. 
Lisa Millis. Uh, Afri- uh, black Back Jackal. African yeah. Black Back Jackal. I feel like But, we're um, never going to forget this one after this. Yeah, It's a good learning curve. This is, uh, this is quite fun, testing our own knowledge and trying to spell these Latin <laughs> words, which is very difficult. And also the thing with the Latin words, everybody's got their own pronunciation. Yeah, that's... So it does vary, and that could also confuse you quite a bit. Well, But I please struggled. Send, send some more in. Um, we'll see what we can do. It's now starting to rain. Again, I can hear it raining a little bit harder now. Yeah. Um, so we may just stay here for a while in the tent. It's nice and cozy and comfy. Um, Less. Uh, I have wet. got yeah. coffee for later. <gasps> I I packed a thermos and I brought coffee for us for later. You might be my favorite person <laughs> in the whole world right now. <laughs> Ellie loves a Ellie loves a coffee. No, I'm, I'm coffee. hoping that. Uh, Tristan has some luck with uh, that female leopard, Tundi, this morning. We saw yeah. her very close to the southern boundary going into Gauri, but I don't know if she crossed. We didn't see her actually cross, so she may Hopefully. still be down in that area. And if there's someone that's going to try and find her, it'll be Tristan. Yeah, so let's go and see where Tristan is and how his search is going. Like, ah, sorry, so we don't have any comms at the moment. Well, I don't know why, because actually, I know why. I forgot to plug myself back in after fixing the roof. That's why. Sorry about that, Kirst. Anyway, we are still on the southern boundary, just kind of cruising along, making sure we look out for any signs of Tandy. She was heading in this kind of direction yesterday, so we're just kind of having a little look around and seeing if there is anything around here. Tracking-wise, though, it's all but sort of I don't know what the word is it's all you know it's, there's really not much point in the tracking just yet I mean, hopefully after the rain now that it's stopping these animals will start coming out and start moving but there's really no sort of tracks that are going to be visible after the amount of rain that we had unless an animal walked in the last half an hour 45 minutes so that's both a blessing and a curse the curse is is that it's going to be very difficult to find some of these animals who might have walked and then laid down early in the evening but there's also going to be a good thing is that if any animal walks now we are going to be able to see their tracks fairly quickly so we're going to try and kind of um well hopefully pick up something and, and see if maybe tundi is just with little cubs somewhere i want to check this old hyena den just in case she's decided to use that little hole as a good place to sit i would be if i was a leopard i think i would go into that little hole although james says it smells very bad so maybe that's why they don't go in there but let's check and see because i believe she was not far from here yesterday is there something in there there's a warthog in there i think is it a warthog yes it is a warthog so there is a big warthog that is in there instead hello warthog Now, we see this warthog here. Now, Chris, do you just repeat that quickly? Because we him the thing said the same thing over you, but I didn't hear what you said. It does look cozy, doesn't it? It look as, looks as though it's very happy with life. And I, I tell you what, if it was raining, like I said, I would also be inside there looking very happy. And I think we've seen this warthog, very same warthog in here, a few times. It seems to enjoy being inside there. It's a good place. It's sheltered. It's quite thick here. So difficult to, to spot that warthog inside there. Although if a male leopard came, this warthog might be in a bit of trouble. But very cool to see. It's the same warthog that hangs around at the little pan on the boundary of Chitra. We see it there wallowing quite often and drinking. It often heads in this direction. You can actually see how much mud is all over its tusks. But that looks like one dozy, happy warthog. I suppose it is a rainy day, so bed weather for sure. And the perfect place for a warthog to have a little rest. You can see a few drops of rain still falling. It's not much, but there is a few still coming down. Very cool to see, though. Very, very cool. Nice. Well, it's not Tandy, but it was still a nice surprise. So we're going to carry on, see if we can find Tandy. I believe this is where Viam and Byron lost her, was in this drainage section, which I can't say I blame them, given that it was pouring with rain, a roof, and even if you have none of that and sunshine and dry, sort of desolate weather, you're still going to struggle to follow a leopard through this. So I think they did a sterling effort 
to be able to get themselves as far as they did given the conditions that they were working in so hopefully she comes out somewhere here right now I'm going to carry on going up on cheetah cut line while I do that though I'm going to send you back across to the tent but I believe that there is a guest appearance lurking for all of you inside we do we have a guest appearance the little flower mantis that just decided to join us now it's a little bit shy so it's almost hiding behind its very very long hands Beautiful no, I'm lady. just joking. I'm just gonna try and stop moving. Sorry, that was me, Ferg. Just wanna try and not move because it was jumping around earlier on, so eventually did decide to stand still on my fingers. And um, we don't get to see them all that often. At least I've only, I think this is only the second one that I've seen in the last while. This is amazing. It's really, really yeah. beautiful. Just as well, you can imagine being of this color and with all these little spikelets, it allows it to hide a lot better in the environment. So amongst the leaves and the grasses, it's pretty much impossible to see it. But I think now that the rain has been falling down and that everything's a little bit cleaner, then we're able to pick up movement a little bit easier. Now, my hand is almost like freestanding, so that's why it's shaking a bit. It's not its not because of the weight of the tiny little mantis. <laughs> I think I'm gonna try and put it back on its leaf. I so you could all is, go in there. I think it's called an eye flower mantid. Eye flower. Eyed flower. Can you see that? I think it, that's the closest I can see. I think you're probably right. That little beautiful one over there. Well, it's got a bit too much pink for this one. I feel like this one's just mostly green. Maybe this is a male. I, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I am sorry, Byron. You clearly had it coming all along. <laughs> all right, little one, do you want to go back onto your leaf? No? He seems to like you. Maybe it is a male. <laughs> okay. oh, no. There he goes. Maybe it was a girl. Running away from Byron. Hmm. That's yeah. <laughs> not very nice. Let's continue with our fun with Latin. <laughs> All right. So now what we're going to do um, is Kirst is going to give us a Latin name and we need to find or guess what animal it is. So this one's from Lunar Moon. All right. Go, go Kirst. We're ready. Oh, but that's but isn't that a family name? But no, I think I know which one, but I think it's Oh dear, I've got no clue. <laughs> <laughs> I've got no clue. Foley Dota. Oh, so the word was Foley Dota, is that uh, correct? Yeah, we don't Foley want to Foley Dota, see it. oh I can't see. Oh no. Um, okay, wait, give me two seconds, Foley Dota. Uh, um, let's see. Foley Dota. I'm going by a hunch here, I'm not oh, too sure. completely wrong. Well, I think what did you write? Pangolin. Oh, <laughs> that's an odd I don't know if, well, I think, but I, I, I thought Foley Dota was the name of the family. I don't know, let's have a look quickly. Um, uh, Ah, I got. I try to get a little bit creative there, so it's an eye. So, Foley Dota, we were looking for it yesterday, and I know you said you were trying to find one in the rain. I said exactly the same thing. I was saying to um, uh, to Viem that after rain like this, usually these animals are quite active because the termites and that are, are a lot, a lot more active. So um, there's one right here. You see, this is what they're going to come and the, eat. We're full elates. of insects right now. So this, unfortunately, this one died yesterday, but this would be a very prized thing, I think, both for aardvarks and pangolins to come and eat. So uh, this would be quite great for the both of them. So the, the Foley Dota is the order of uh, pangolin. Okay. So not genus or species. The genus and species names are um, the Temix ground pangolin, which is the one we see. And that is Smatia Temink. Smutsia to minky eye. <laughs> Smutsia to minky eye. <laughs> that is, that's a scientific, I'll show you how we, so, um. Can I tell you how a Latin person would pronounce it? How would you? Smutsia to minky. <laughs> Smutsia to minky. But there's no way of knowing if you're right or if I'm right. Yeah, I feel okay. like we can come up with Smutsia our own language. Smutsia to minky. 
The two eyes, to minky eye. Minky eye. Eye. Anyway, so order is a foley dota. No wonder I don't know it. No, we don't. We don't see them ever. <laughs> Seems like Tristan is still searching for Tandy. I wonder if he's gone all the way to Chitwa now, or if he's still checking on the boundary. Probably one of the few roads that he can drive at the moment with all the rain. And while I'm being attacked by flying things, let's head back to him. Well, indeed. So we are still on our side. We're just checking now Ledward and we'll do Mamba, Batalia, Central. Try and just check around just to see if she's no, maybe not come back towards where the last sort of known sighting of the Cub was. So we're just kind of doing little loops and, and just slowly driving around and checking. Now, I believe there was, for those of you that remember our two Cheetah brothers, they were seen this morning apparently going into Torchwood, which is quite nice. So apparently both looking healthy and happy, which is good news. And it's always nice just to catch up with old kind of characters that we haven't seen for a while. Shana, you're wondering if the animal's scent is stronger when they are wet from the rain. So, no, not really. I mean, I suppose some of them smell like damp animal, so almost like wet dog in a way. That does happen from time to time. I mean, not really, no. Uh, I don't find that they smell more. In fact, I find that it's harder to smell things when it rains because the rain kind of deadens their scent and makes it a lot harder to kind of actually pick them up. And particularly things like... Um, leopard urine so when they spray now when it rains it just washes all that away and you don't get that popcorn smell that you would normally get now the bird that was sitting in the tree there is a batelier eagle so there was two of them actually the other one flew away but this is the pair that hangs around between ledward and mamba they've got a nest on the northern side of ledward but it's very far into the bush and quite obscured but they do have a nest and you can see that poor bird looks quite bedraggled those feathers are absolutely soaked it's little crown is not looking as spiffy as it normally does certainly doesn't have the big round fluffy head that they have when it's nice and dry and even the white feathers look kind of drowned in the black it doesn't really look like a happy bird does it poor thing it must have been properly wet and so it will be waiting for this rain to stop and then it hopefully will dry out and be able to start flying and looking for food it must have been a tough sort of last 24 hours for a lot of our birds given the amount of water that has fallen and I would imagine that a number of little baby birds, so little chicks in nests, will have died unfortunately during all of this because they suffer from cold quite quickly and exposure and so they just unfortunately kill over and die which is not very nice at all. Right, come on, Tandy, out you come, don't be shy. Checking all the big pathways and game paths as well. Tracks are very few and bar, far between at the moment. Green quality, wondering how long Tundi would leave the cub alone in weather like this. Um, I think it, as long as it takes her to find food, sometimes she'll leave a cub for, you know, 24 hours, uh, maybe even as much as 48, but Tandy is an interesting one. I, she seldom seems to be that far away from that cub. She seems to do all her hunting very localized to where the cub is, so she doesn't really kind of move around too much. She finds a place and, and she stay, stores that cub and then she makes do with where the cub is by just hunting in that particular zone and, and she normally finds what she's looking for. So I don't think she will go too far. I, I wouldn't be surprised if she actually is back with the cub now and the two of them are together in this in this horrible kind of cold wet weather. Right, that's an impala track. So I'm looking very carefully to try and see if I can see those little digits on the road because if we find those then we are going to have gold because they are if they're on top of the rain then we know that she won't be very far away what are you doing here it's a zebra it's very odd hello zebras why are you here all the way down in these thickets it's a strange place to find two zebras I think these are the two zebras that we've been seeing on quarantine a bit and now you're running away what did we say hmm probably a little bit nervous given that they are in an area that is not ideal for zebras very dense in there and lions i think would love to come across those two zebras in a thicket like that because perfect place to hunt them right maybe it's because they came across tandy 
and they're a little nervous and Tani's going to be lying on this termite mound up in front. Right, now I'm going to carry on, see what else I can find and, and while I do that, let's send you back across to the duo and watch them suffer as they deal with Latin and the animal names. <laughs> Well, I'm suffering. Ellie's <laughs> not suffering at all, Tristan. Uh, I'm the one suffering. All right, so we go no. straight into the next one. Let's see what. Bring Kirsten's it on, Kirst. We're ready. Mm. Thank you. Melivora patensis. Um, okay, I think I know which one this is. Uh, um, I think this is one that I do know because it is one of my favorite animals. Yes. <laughs> so I think I know that. Is that correct? Yes. <laughs> and in I owe now. for an extra point in <laughs> Latin. All right. Ooh. What was it? Melivora catensis. Cap what is it? I feel like if I say it to you, I'm going to give it away. I can't hear curse. Capensis. Yeah. Well sorry, done. I didn't hear curse. No, that's fine. We'll help you, Byron. We'll help you. We're a team after all. Come on. Did you, what did How you did write? you write? Melivora capensis. Yeah. Exactly Either we, we win or we go down together. Yeah. <laughs> Melivora yeah. capensis. And Ooh. we are... Correct, oh. and where is the honey badger yeah, skull? Well, not behind me. <laughs> Fergus has been here a lot, so he knows the honey badger yeah. skull. Let me see if I can find the Let's honey badger skull. Just... Um, I'm going to vote for this one. I think it's this one too. Oh, now Ferg turns out <laughs> has no idea. So I think we oh, might... we're right. I'm sure James is. Oh, Chris dear. doesn't know either. Where is James when we need him? This looks like a, I don't know. Is that a honey badger skull? Do any of you know? I think we might need to get some help from the Send internet. Send your tweet to hashtag Safari Live. Is this the honey badger skull? I think it is, but I, ew, I don't know. I don't know. We'll, uh, we'll have to ask those of you who have seen James in here. Um, I'm sure he's pointed it out a few times. Um, Fergs, I thought you knew. Yeah, Ferg, Ferg you. definitely tricked us. We assumed that he knew which one it was, but I think it would either be that one or what about that top one there? No. Uh, mm, no. No. Anyway, we learn as we go. I do apologize, Ellie, that you broke... Uh, well, you didn't break a rule. I broke a rule. We were touching stuff in James's tent. So I do apologize, James. Um, this one, James. <laughs> There we go. I feel I'll, like we need I'll to... clean it for you, James. <laughs> James' spirit is everything. here. Um, it... Not that we're terrified or anything whatsoever. Not at, at all. all. Not at all. <laughs> now, let's uh, give a quick weather update, shall we? Let's just have a look. Let's I mean, go. It's tough um, for... Excuse me, Fergs. Let me run out here. That was a serval uh, skull. No, that was a serval skull, looked a apparently. Oh. Um, just having a look now, uh, because I know it's tough when Tristan's driving around, he's got the roof on. It's still a slight drizzle, nothing too serious, but it's got a lot darker than earlier. We yeah. had the beautiful light, but if you look, it's especially over this side, there's still some serious cloud cover, and um, and this rain is not, uh, not going anywhere for the mm. moment. Pretty much all over us. Which is not, not bad. I didn't get all of it. So Caitlin <laughs> asked uh, when it rains as hard as this or during the night it rained really hard. Do we get to sleep as much? Um, I woke up once or twice when the rain got really yeah. hard because of our, our of tin wonderful roofs. tin roofs. But um, it wasn't it wasn't no. too bad. I, don't think, I think also, Caitlin, because we were so cold yesterday, after dinner, everybody was just completely tired. So yes. we all went to bed and that helps with the sleeping. So yeah. we all just pretty much yeah. passed out in our rooms. So. Everybody disappeared <laughs> very, very early after dinner. Um, so, um, yeah, yeah it's, I prefer sleeping in the rain. It's a lot cooler. It's much, much better. So I enjoyed it. Yeah, I enjoyed me too. It. I love the rain. Um, all right. Let's see how Trist is enjoying the rain. Is he wet? Has he found a leopard? What's going on, Tristan? <laughs> so 
it's not really raining. It's kind of a few little drops here. Yes, yes, I know. I'm sorry. Quiet down. Just set off the local bird population. Oopsie. But it's not really raining. So not. I mean, there's a few drops here and there, but it's not really wet. I wouldn't call it wet. Put it that way. And um, no leopard, unfortunately. No tracks for a leopard. We're on Mamba now. So I'm just slowly going to go on Mamba. Now I actually want to show you guys something because yesterday I was doing some signal testing in some of the cars and I had to drive Mamba to do it. And I came across a herd of elephants who were in the process of being about as naughty as Daryl the elephant is. And I'll show you why I say that fairly shortly because I found them on Mamba Road and I thought at first, oh, nice to see some Ellie's, always good when driving around to see some things. And then I kind of got to the road and I was like, these elephants are not good at all. And basically what the Ellie's did is they got onto this road and they decided for some odd reason that they wanted to dig on this road. And so they've dug a massive, massive hole right slap bang in the middle. I hope that it, maybe with the rain it's kind of flooded it and filled it a little bit, but it is a huge hole that they've dug. So I'll have to kind of get a little bit closer to it. It's just over the top here where the pipes are. I don't know if you, any of you remember when they had pipes on this road that were being pulled up by the elephants constantly, but that's exactly where they were. And maybe it's because of those pipes they were looking for more pipe to pull up and play with. But you can see here, just like this termite mound, that there is a disturbance on the road itself. Now the, the hole that they dug was quite serious in some places, so it's actually filled in quite nicely, which is good. But that is from elephants, that is what they've done to the road, they've literally mangled it. And it's interesting because this road, you can imagine, is very hard. After many cars have driven on it, sun's baked it, it gets like this cap on it. And so for an elephant to dig down underneath that is pretty amazing to me. Now the deep, deep hole is the one the furthest away from us. You can actually see it's full with water at the moment. So it's that one over there. That is a massive well. And if you drive into that now and not knowing what you're doing, your whole wheel is going to get stuck inside there. So pretty dangerous thing for elephants to have done. And we'll have to try and kind of get a fixing. And in fact, there's an elephant right there talking about elephants. They obviously know I was talking about them and they've kind of just meandered over the road. So let's try and catch up with them. Child of the universe, you say it's like the elephants are making tracks for us to be able to meander about on. Well, yes, I suppose it is a little bit like that, isn't it? Although they're destroying the ones that we already have created, the nice, smooth, lovely tracks they are now making into big bumpy holes. And there goes one Ellie across the road. I think that's the last of the grouping. There's only two that I saw. They don't look like the most relaxed elephants. Yes, why have you got your head up raised at me? So, again, not a very relaxed demeanor at all. When they lift their head like that and raise their sort of chin and open their ears, it's trying to kind of say to you, that's far enough, don't go any further. What you can also see is that that elephant is as dark as it gets. It is completely soaked and that skin is actually absorbing a lot of that moisture and that's why they get so dark like that. But there looks to be only two of them that I can see, a female and maybe her young one. I don't see any more on my left side, I mean my right side heading towards us like these guys have, but they disappearing already into this thicket. That's one thing with the rain is that it's getting to a situation, hold on Billy, I think if we go around this bush we might still be able to see them. It's one thing with the rain is it's about to get insanely thick and viewing of animals is going to become a lot harder. The grass is going to get very long and so we're going to find that our leopards and some of our cats are going to just disappear in these thickets. You can see a little bit of movement there and that's a whole elephant that's busy disappearing behind some foliage and branches and trees and all kinds of other things. Amazing though. It's amazing how such a big animal can blend in so well. Right. Hang on, Ellie's disappeared. Let's carry on. There's some impalas in front that are busy having a little drink by the looks of things on the road. So you'll find this is the other thing now is that finding of animals is going to be so much harder because you know, when it's dry, animals have to go to water, and so that makes it easy for us. We can just go and check water points, and animals invariably have either been there and left some sort of sign in the form of tracks, or are going in that direction, or are there themselves. Now, with water on roads like this, you're going to find many of the animals will be drinking on places like that, and will not be going towards water holes at all. And so places like Twin Dams, Treehouse, 
those are going to become pretty much sort of obsolete in terms of our viewing experience over for the next couple of weeks if it continues to rain the way it is. The good news is though that when we were at Twin Dams, the dam is looking very full. We can't drive on the dam walls though, so we couldn't really get you a nice view of it. But it is looking nice and full and I would imagine Treehouse is looking good and Gauri Dam definitely has water. So if you look on the dam cam, Gauri Dam is filled up quite nicely. Still don't think there's enough water in Gauri Dam to last the winter, but hopefully the rain continues and we'll see some more in the future and that the dam will be fuller as we go forward. Now these two I think can't decide whether they want to drink or whether they want to fight with one another in the rutting. You can see they're kind of dropping their heads every now and then. There's a little bit of gesturing and lip smacking and head tilting but there is a puddle between the two of you. Maybe that's how mom stops them from fighting. It's just, oh there's a Nyala as well. Hello Nyala. There's a nice difference between Impalas and Nyalas and a little jumpy baby as well. Very cool to see. Seems like everything is just in this little spot. Oh, look at that tiny baby. That's very small. Hello, little one. They are beautiful animals, though, both of them. Impalas and Nyalas. We have some spectacular antelope in this country. We get very, very pretty markings on them, and they all look quite exotic, so I thoroughly enjoy most of our antelope. But the boys have stopped their game now. Water has been had and now it's back off to go and feed. The nice thing for a lot of the animals as well today is that they won't even have to go to water points. Things like Steenbok and Dyka will get all their moisture, just um, feed off the grass and get the water content that they need from there. Right, now I'm going to send you back across to those two hooligans in the tent for one last time because I believe Ali is going to come join me out and about on a vehicle but let's go see what they're doing and I'm pretty sure more laughs will ensue. <laughs> Again with hooligans Tristan. No, no, we're not hooligans. We're actually being very well behaved. I hey, think. we're even doing Latin stuff. Exactly. I think we are not hooligans definitely. Not at all, not at all. All right, so Maybe last one, and then I think, uh, Ellie, you, you said you want to try head out? Yeah. Let's see. It almost sounded Byron and I could hear faintly lions in the distance, so perhaps if the weather is not that bad, we might be able to follow up on those lions from yesterday, because I was just saying this morning, I heard them roaring just as we closed down, and it sounded like it was coming from that area where we were looking for them yesterday, so I'm sure they were just hiding in the rain. So maybe today we'll be lucky. No. I hope so. I hope so. All right. We're ready for our last Word. Last one from Cindy, Latin name, let's see. Oh, okay, a bird of prey. No clue. What is, oh, what is it again? Polymatus? 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 Helicoitus. Bellicosus. <laughs> we're struggling we're struggling to hear Kirsi. okay that's a tough one uh Kirsi said she'll give us a clue it's a bird of prey so that's very difficult um Martis. should we just Martis. um i'm just gonna go i have no clue for this one this one maybe perhaps uh, i think i'm right there we go no the, the, the eagle <laughs> um I'm right, yes. <laughs> well doctor? done, Byron. Well done. Clearly you're a doctor. You're <laughs> <a rascal. laughs> what is it? Marshall Eagle. Is it? Oh, that's I exactly what I wrote. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> uh, yeah, Can no. you say it again, Chris? Because this is not, this you is know, our everyday difficult. language. Okay. okay. Okay, let's try to write the Latin word, yeah? I'm um, going on a limp here. I'm sure that this time I would have gotten another one of them wrong. But anyway. Uh, I feel like there, there's probably like a know. Y somewhere I, in there. I, 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 it's tough to hear. Polymatus bellicosis. Woo! I'm right. <laughs> what did yes. you write? <laughs> Yes, I got one back. <laughs> well done, Bob. Well done, Ellie. Thank you very, very much. Well, thank you for playing fun with Latin. Fun with, uh, fun with Latin with Ellie and, and Byron. <laughs> <laughs> we 
you're going for the big time, guys. You're going to get a Netflix. Yeah, we, will, so. we will, we will, we so, will have yeah. about maybe yeah. two subscribers on our on our show if we ever went live with yeah. fun yeah. with Latin. <laughs> Learners uh, duos. That's the Latin for learning with. I, I believe alien. you. <laughs> Whatever you want to say, I'll believe. You. <laughs> <laughs> no, right. No, there's been... Well, Byron, it's All been right. wonderful. So I'm going to head out. Great. Hopefully I won't have to come back because <laughs> yeah, I don't want to get wet again. Good luck. Um, I hope the rain holds off and I hope you have luck with the lions. I'm going to hang around here and see what else we can find. Perfect. Um, enjoy. Let's go back to Tristan. At least he won't be out there alone for much longer. Woohoo. Well, hopefully not, Byron. I'm sure you two have had fun in the tent, and I'll stop calling you hooligans. I'm very sorry, Byron. That was my sincere apology to Byron. But we stopped here because there was a squirrel that was making lots and lots of noise, and it was alarm calling, but now it's stopped. So there it is, sitting on top of its... Oh, don't, don't run away now. And it'll shake the water off. Got to groom one's back leg. So from alarm calling to grooming... Of back legs and oh, have you got water on your face little one shame I think it's trying to get rid of all the water now it's just getting its tail in good condition you look spiffy don't worry you look ready to go to work it's a bit of a jumpy squirrel isn't it it's cleaning itself as though it'll never be able to clean itself again and it needs to do it right now and you can see why we say squirrel syndrome because they just kind of bounce around all over the place one minute they're doing scratching work are you going to go to the toilet I think it just urinated you know that anyway and there it goes down into the grass if you weren't wet before you are going to be very wet now little squirrel and off it goes through well done Vildi following a squirrel in long green grass is not the easiest thing very good well done right Let's see why, maybe the squirrel was alarm calling for a bird or a snake, a little slithery snake, and VM told me that Byron and VM, that they saw a black mamba last night, which is very, very cool. So, it seems as though the mambas have actually been fairly, sort of, common place the last few, sort of, weeks and months. Alyssa, you want to know what my favorite reptile is? in the bush um, I'm not quite sure actually I there's a few that I that I like um, funny enough I think I would go with ooh, I'm torn I I'm torn between crocodiles because I find them fascinating I find crocodiles absolutely amazing creatures in that they are able to do what they do survive for as long as they've survived and just how they go about things and the, and this the specialities that they have in their body in order to do what they do. So I really have a lot of respect for them and I, and I think they command a lot of respect given the way they go about their business. They are incredibly intelligent animals and I love kind of watching them and studying how they do things. So crocodiles are, from a respect point of view, they're not exactly pretty animals as we know. So from that point of view in terms of um, the other one that I always like seeing I know it's gonna sound really odd but seeing these massive pythons is always incredible I find them pretty fascinating too and also I suppose because of how rare they've become big pythons are just something we don't really see anymore and it's because they feared and, and you know big big snakes that are five meters six meters long are feared by a lot of people and so they inevitably get killed a lot more than they should and, and you know a snake of five meters is a very very old snake that snake could be easily 50 years old and so you know killing snakes like that is really not a good thing at all and, and a number of big pythons unfortunately have been killed because people are fearful of them so I think those two would be mine VM yours gecko gecko. Ooh, gecko is a good one I do like a gecko too and geckos are very cool well done Voldy I think that's a very good call I think a gecko is a fine idea now these impalas look very nervous they don't look as though they are relaxed at all you can see they're a bit boundy but sort of watchful I suppose it is conditions that make every animal on edge given that it's been raining all night it's probably you know water drops from the trees which makes a lot of noise and it's gloomy so it's just not easy to see this rain would have deadened the scent as we were talking about earlier of a lot of these animals and so you know it's, I suppose that's why they're a little bit more jumpy than they normally would be right it's
Vombogel, the rut season for these impalas is about to begin. So we are going to go into it in April. Uh, you start to see it at the end of March, but April and May and June, those three months are absolute chaos when it comes to rutting. They're going to chase each other around all over the place. They're going to make lots of gargling and gurgling and splattering and snorting noises that sound like death is coming swiftly towards your doorstep, but it is just a little innocent impala chasing another innocent impala around. So it always makes me laugh when, when we used to get guests out here when I was guiding. And it was always first time guests and they came during the rut they would absolutely be petrified the first time they heard impalas rutting and it was always funny because you used to do your first afternoon drive and sometimes you wouldn't see impalas until you stopped for drinks and then you would stop for your sundowner and all of a sudden this gargling splattering growling horrible sound would emanate from very close by because generally you stop where there's a nice view and an open section and the impalas start coming out there you know in the course of the night and these people would just go white with fear and kind of immediately ask is that a lion and you would have to then explain to them no nope, it's not a lion it is in fact just a harmless antelope that doesn't want to do anything to you oh hello There's some more Ellie's though, very pregnant female by the looks of things, although she's still suckling a rather old calf, which is strange. That calf must be easily six, seven years old. Why are you suckling, little calf? You are far too large to be suckling. Hmm, interesting. I wonder if it's maybe because she's so heavily pregnant, maybe she's starting to produce, and that's why this little one is getting. You can see it's already got quite big tusks. Now they're coming up the road, and they want to probably use the road, so I'm going to just get out of their way quickly and let them come past. Sorry guys, hold on, let me just move out your way. I will move shortly. Just give me two seconds. There we go. There we go. Sorry girl, I'm out your way now. Oh, there's also a very cool bird up in the tree there that we will get to just now. But there we go. There's enough space there, Vim, for them. Yes, there should be enough space for her to get past. But little one wants to drink first. It's decided I am not ready for my pilgrimage just yet. Oh, our bird flew away, but there was a ground hornbill that was also around. So, Kirsty, you are commenting on the very white toenails. So, yes, the elephants will have white toenails, every single one of them. And the reason why their toenails are going to be so white is because they've got the same thing as what we get if we spend too much time in the bath is that their feet get so wet that they almost get dead man's foot if you want to call it that as opposed to our dead man's finger which is when our fingers go all wrinkly from an oversupply of moisture and then it's the same thing with the ellies so it actually makes their toes go very very white from walking around in the grass hello girl you are a beautiful individual and so relaxed too well done very calm with your little one it's amazing sometimes. You can see with Ellie's, if you actually just get out of their way and you stay nice and quiet, and there's a lot of people in the world that would think that we are absolutely mad for sitting the way we sat there and just kind of pulling off. But when you are away, well, you allow Ellie's just to do their thing and you're not aggressive towards them anyway, they can actually be the most gentle of creatures. Right. That was very cool. We're going to carry on. I'll try and see if I can find that ground hornbill again that flew away. But while we look for that, let's send you back across to Byron, who must feel like he's back in school being punished with all kinds of questions in Latin. A little bit, a little bit, Tristan. But um, we are also doing some game viewing right outside the tent. And we've got uh, young and Yala and a female just wandering past they are one of my favorite antelopes always so relaxed and she just saw us and um completely comfortable with us being around here very peaceful very very peaceful antelope i saw a wildebeest wildebeest um on the clearings through the back just moving past i'm sure there's a few wildebeest out there at the moment especially in weather like this now um, the i suppose seeing as we've been on scientific names the scientific name for the inyala is trigellophus and angusia um uh, angusai angusia angusai and um but part of that trigellophus uh, or Tragelaphus, again, the pronunciation, depending on how you pronounce it. Tragelaphus um, genus, along with the Kudu, the Sitatunga, and the Bushbuck. We spoke about it yesterday. We did have a question about the Bongo. 
and the bongo is in fact part of that trigelophus family and i actually want to show you a picture of one quickly so let's go back to the tent um i've got my mammal book of africa here and um, that has got a lovely image of the bongo and i'll show you exactly where it occurs uh, let me just find it quickly Again, because all these mammals are here, the book is a lot larger. Bongo, bongo, bongo. Uh, one for it. And the other thing um, that I wanted to share with you was we were correct that this is the skull of, um, of the honey badger. There we go. So we were right. Ali and I were both right. We guessed it correct. That is the honey badger skull. Um, we Googled just to double check and make sure. So that was or is the honey badger skull. So at least we got that right. <laughs> um, okay, let me show you this bongo quickly. There we go. Have a look at that. That is a bongo. It looks like a giant inyala, doesn't it? But uh, you notice the male doesn't change color like the female does. They are both that reddish coloration, um, which is... Uh, they are really amazing, amazing creatures. Now, they um, uh, they occur, I think, in, in Congo, in the lowlands of Congo. Um, and I'm trying to think if there's anywhere else. Have a look. Uh, beautiful animals. But, uh, yeah, Congo uh, and in the Guinea, uh, Ghanaian forests of West Africa. So, and isolated areas in Kenya and Mount Kenya, but uh, yeah, mainly in the Congo. I've never seen one of these before. I'd love to see one, they're huge. I'll show you just to scale. Um, there's a wonderful scale of the size of the bongo compared to a human. So that's a rather, rather, rather large Oh, I've got flies all over me now. Rather large antelope, but I'm sure it would be beautiful to see. All right, well, now the Latin winner is out on drive. So let's see what Ali's plan was. I know she wanted to sit, try to follow up on those lines that we heard. So let's go across now and see where she's headed to. Well, we do want to follow up on, on those lions that we heard because when Byron and I were at the tent, we could hear a faint, almost like contact calling because it wasn't roaring. So I'm going to go to the area where we roughly agreed that we thought the sound was coming from, although with this condition, sometimes see, uh, things can be a little bit tricky and just head onto the wrong, onto the wrong part thinking that we are going onto the right one. But uh, I'm going to check anyway, just to see if perhaps we get lucky and see any, any lions this morning. That would be probably a prize winning, considering that we got probably soaked yesterday trying to find them. And I have no doubt that they were in there. But anyway, hopefully we'll get lucky. Who knows? Maybe we'll bump into somebody else on the way. That would also be quite nice if we could find anyone. It is looking a little gloomy now. Anna Marie, you're wondering if there are any anacondas found in South Africa or also in uh, South uh, or only in South America. Now, as far as I know, anacondas are only in the rainforest or in the Amazon rainforest and other wet parts of the South American continent. However, we get similar um, snake species around this area, which would have to be the pythons. Pythons and anacondas are roughly, I would say, in very broad terms fairly similar. Just the anacondas I think are more water dwelling than what the pythons really are, at least the rock pythons that we get here in South Africa. But that's if I saw an anaconda here I would get very worried. Now I have seen anacondas in South America and they can get very big, probably not as big as the movie Anaconda because that was a terrifying or the biggest anaconda. I had nightmares as a kid when I saw that movie. But uh, they can get very big. I actually know, so my uncle, he, I remember he was telling me a story and this was many years ago. He had many, many dogs and he went onto a farm. Now, I don't remember exactly where the farm was, but I think it was towards the central part of Venezuela, which is the country that I was born and grew up in. And he went onto this farm and then, he, I, don't, I think he went somewhere into the farm. 
that obviously had a lot of pans and dams and so on. And he had a dog, you know, medium sized dog, probably as big as a Labrador. Woo! I just got attacked by a spider web that almost went into my mouth. Ugh. Behind your neck now. It's behind me. Yeah. It's okay. Is is it the spider? Yeah. Okay, hello. What's I don't know what spider it is, but hopefully we can get it out. Oh, you are quite an interesting one. I, I don't think I've ever seen the spider before. Maybe Byron can help us. Because it's almost got like, you see a little thing sticking up on it. Interesting. No, don't go. Just hold still. Hold still so Byron can look at you. I have, I don't know, it almost looks like a rhinoceros spider. Knowing South Africans, that would probably be the name that the spider has. And now I've lost it. Have you gone down my jacket? Nope. Nope. Okay, well, I don't know where it's gone off to. I think it is down my jacket. Okay, come. Out. Off you go. Spiders don't li live in people's jackets. Woo! Okay. Okay, well, this is quite a tricky spider. There we go. It's now on the dashboard, finally, and not on my jacket anymore. And it's decided it doesn't want to be on TV. I hope that was enough for Byron to get a glimpse. That's quite an interesting one if he does uh, manage to help us identify it. I've never seen that one before. So it almost seems like a type of jumping spider, but I'm not sure. Oh, and he has to find the Latin name. Ooh, sorry, Byron, that's a double challenge there. <laughs> that's not going to be an easy one. So just to wrap up on this story about this, this dog, so he went into an area and imagine it was rainy like this and there are different, it's almost like a marshy area. So there are a lot of places where dogs go and swim and then they go here and then they go there. And normally in South America, or at least in these parts, we're not too afraid of going into the water. Yes, there are anacondas there or they can be, but they tend to really not bother humans all that much. So he went for a walk or whatever and he couldn't find this dog and he couldn't find this dog and I think the, go the, the dog had one of those telemetry radios, couldn't find it, couldn't find it, called it for hours, the dog didn't come back so they decided to leave because they, it, they had to go back because this was during the weekend and as they, the, the following weekend they decided to go back to this place just to go and look for the dog but they came with all the telemetry equipment to try and see where the dog had been because I don't remember what breed it was but I seem to remember that it was quite an expensive breed of dog for whatever reason. So they eventually start following, they pick up the signal of the color and they go and they approach it and they see that there's nothing around them, only a, a, you know, a water hole or a marshy spot where there's some water. So obviously things were not boating well already when you see that going on and then they come across and then as they go into the, 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 uh, the water hole, they found this massive anaconda that had actually eaten the dog entire dog so they fortunately killed the anaconda which is not the, the greatest part of the story but when they took it out the full dog and i'm talking about you know a labrador sized dog a very big dog had been um, swallowed entire by the anaconda i think that was probably one of my scariest memories from when i was a kid just remembering that they could you know i was the size of a dog they could have eaten me which was crazy now I'll go to Tristan and I believe he's with a creature that anacondas or well likely pythons in this time of in this part of the world like to eat too. Exactly. An anaconda would have to travel quite some time to find an impala in their side of the world. And actually Viam and I were just it was he was just telling me about a story and something he read about an anaconda eating a mountain lion recently, which is pretty insane when you think about it. So amazing that snakes can grab something like that. But we are with a rather common sight in Kruger. In fact, if you were to think of Kruger when I was a kid, this is what I would have thought of, is impalas in the road wiggling their little white tails. They are a very big part of our ecosystem here and often they go unnoticed and, and often overlooked by many, many people. I and mean, here we, we often talk about them, but I know a lot of people really kind of just dismiss impalas as common antelope and that they don't really have any value to what's going on but that's it's a bit of a lie and can you imagine if there was no impalas left if they became a rare antelope how people would want to see them just because of what they look like they are very pretty uh, animals they've got these amazing markings on them and so 
it's a bit of a pity that people do look at them in that way. Now, what we've got is basically just a mixed group. It's males, females, young ones, they're all kind of together. I would imagine that these have come from some sort of an open clearing and it's now time to start looking for food you can see that because of the rain there's been uh, there'll be a massive increase in the number of flies and mosquitoes and insects in general and you can see that by the tails just look at how every single one of their tails are waggling waggling around and that's because of all the flies that are out i've had many land on me already this morning and so it's going to be commonplace for the animals to be absolutely irritated by insects over the course of the next few weeks and months. So going to be good that they've got food, but there will be irritations that these little ones probably haven't really experienced until now. But very cool to see. And you'll find the little ones will be very active this morning. They're going to be bouncing around all over the place. Rain makes young animals very playful. And so I wonder if we get... There you go. Exactly like that. <laughs> How cool is that? It's got a little freestyle kick and run. So some of them are a little bit more artistic than others. I wonder if Byron can do the same jump like that in Parlor can. He seems like an athletic fella. He was telling me about how he's been playing rugby over the weekend. So maybe he can show us just how he does his little sidestep and run from his rugby days and whether or not he's good at it. He says to me that he is. He tells me that he's got a great sidestep on him. Unga, you want to know what is the difference between an impala and a springbok? Well, I think for that we're going to have to get a picture of a springbok for you. But give me two seconds because I don't have any of my books when it's raining like this. I don't bring my books out for fairly obvious reasons. So I'm going to try and find you a springbok quickly. Hopefully it's not going to bring up our rugby logo because the rugby team is still in the bad books even though it was a while ago. Right, here we go. So let's see if we can... Hold on, VM. I'm going to try and see. Ah, oh, there we go. That's going to be better. So I've hopefully got this right. There we go. Okay, that's going to be better to show you all of you. So you saw with the impalas up in front there that they were a little bit different. This is a springbok. So what you see with the springbok is a very different shaped horn. They've got these kind of horns that bend in and curl towards them. Well, towards each other. They've got this white face. And then if you look on the body, the most distinguishing factor is this black line that runs through the side of their body with a very white tummy and then this white big fluffy tail. Now that white fluffy tail when they are pronking, because they pronk, they don't, I mean, sorry, stotting, when they stot, because the, no, they pronk, that's right, they do pronk, sorry. So anyway, when they're doing that, they display the white tail, which then shows off to the others and do their thing. So I'll try and find a picture of their white tail, whereas if you look at the impalas in the background, you'll notice no black line across the flank of their body. They also don't have as white a stomach area and no white face with a proper long tail. They don't just have a fluffy kind of ball of white on the back. And also their horns on the males, when we see the males, you'll find they have a very different shape horn structure as well. So look quite different when you see them side by side, but it can be a bit confusing if you haven't seen one or the other. It's a little tougher to see, but hopefully that helps you and you'll be able to know how to do it in the future and ID the two of them. Good. I think we're going to carry on. We're going to see if maybe there is some sign of Tundi somewhere here. We've been stopping at all these antelope just in case some of them alarm called, but there's been nothing. It's been very quiet this morning. No lions roaring, no alarm calls anywhere. But we're going to carry on and hopefully Brainiac Byron will be able to entertain you with his knowledge and bursting amounts of skill that come out between his ears. <laughs> well, I'm trying my best. Now, Ellie had that beautiful little spider. I caught a glimpse of it. I'm not sure. I, I wish I had a better look of it, though. Um, or look at it rather, but it looked like it might be a little bark spider. Now, the only reason I say that is because I know the bark spiders, and if you have a look, they do get these beautiful protrusions on the back often, and the reason for that is so that they blend in very well to a tree. So they may look um, like they have got a thorn or some protrusion on the back, looks like part of a tree, a thorn tree perhaps, and I think that's maybe, I'm not sure, I think that's maybe what uh, what Ali saw was possibly a bark spider. Um, they fascinating little spiders. I love the bark spiders because they're mainly nocturnal. You will see them during the day, but what happens is at night, they spin beautiful webs very quickly. 
one sat with guests. We watched them spin it. We watched a single spider spin a web in about half an hour, 40 minutes. It spun an entire web right across the road. And this spider would go up and down and in circles. It was amazing to see. Then what happens is the spider sits and waits, obviously, for insects to fly into the web, goes and eats. And then at uh, during the day, what happens is it eats the web again because all that webbing is made up of protein and doesn't want to lose that protein. So it eats part of the web again, then climbs back up, goes onto the branch where the, the web started from, and it will sit and hide there and blend into the tree, hide its legs and sit and sleep and rest during the day. And then at night, the same process. Uh, so I hope, I'm not sure, but I hope I'm right. I hope it was a, a form one of the bark spiders. I'm not sure. Elia, now, um, they, I don't think those bark spiders are venomous to, to us or can cause any harm. They do have venom. Now, the spiders, usually the venom, they inject the venom into their prey. And, uh, and what that does is those enzymes break down the, the body of the prey that they've caught and killed. And then the spider is able to actually drink the prey. They drink their food. So all those enzymes, the venom that they inject into their prey, breaks it all down and that's how they feed so yes i'm sure that that bark spider has got venom and that is how it eats but it's harm harmless to us just like those beautiful big golden orb web spiders we see i know a lot of people are quite frightened of them because they are really beautiful but very big and scary and uh, those are harmless to us too so a lot of the bigger spiders and the scary looking spiders aren't that bad it's those little ones those little brown ones that we've got to watch out for now i wonder if ali's had any luck with those lions i'm sure we heard them calling in the distance but it may even have been beyond our boundary i'm not sure so let's go across to ali now and find out how her lion search is going Well, it seems like no luck for now. I am doing the southern boundary, uh, not the southern one, sorry, the eastern boundary. And I cannot really find anything around here. What it does seem is that the rain has washed away a lot of the roads. And it'll be a little bit hard to travel along certain roads just because if we do travel them now, even though the rain has already damaged them, we're going to damage them even more. And perhaps even get stuck and just create an unnecessary drama for ourselves. So there are certain areas that I'm avoiding just also because of the type of soil. Now this particular road, it's all sandy soil and it, the water would have filtrated and gone underground quite easily, more than some other types of soil that we get towards the central parts of Juma that are more clay soil. So you can imagine it becomes like a bog almost with all that water nestled in there. Now we haven't had any luck with the lions here. We did stop for a little while to try and listen out but it seems like maybe they've gone to sleep, maybe they're just not keen on calling anymore, but we're still keeping an eye out and we've got a plan for the morning. So hopefully, hopefully they'll perform for us today. And if not, well, you know, it's always worth searching for them. So I'm gonna go on the big cat hunt while Tristan is on the Tandy hunt. And then <laughs> while <laughs> poor Byron is stuck with the Latin hunt. Now that was an interesting little spider. I've never seen a spider with that shape. so. It it's one of the good things about the the rain. It brings all the creepy, creepy crawlies out and about. So we had the praying mantis this morning. We had the alates, the spider. It's very nice. Gilup, you're wondering if we have any problems with mosquitoes or flies on the drives. Well, normally not when we're driving. So when we're driving is fine because the wind just takes everyone away but when you stop that's when we tend to get attacked now I don't get bitten by mosquitoes all that much I think I'm one of the lucky ones but the the flies can be annoying especially if you're in a place where animals have recently defecated <laughs> then you can imagine that there are flies everywhere oh, it seems like Tristan managed to find somebody that's calling this morning so let's go have a look Indeed we have. Just listen to this. So 
second, you hear this female ground hornbill is calling, and I think it's the same ground hornbill that we keep seeing by itself. And that's probably why it's calling like this. How cool is that? So Linda, you say that's such a cool sound. Well, especially in conditions like this, it's kind of an eerie sound, isn't it? It matches the weather a little bit, but I really like it. It's this hollow kind of deep sound, and it's because of that beak that they can make such a big sound like that. But shame, she's obviously trying to look for a mate. I wonder if this is what's happened is she's distributed out. What you find is that young birds often distribute out of a flock, and maybe she's now trying to call a mate, and there's no other ground hornbills that's with her at the moment. And that's why she's constantly calling like this in order to try and find a male to have, well, to have little eggs with and to have chicks. It's good though if she is calling and she is looking for a male because that means that hopefully she's going to produce eggs and we need all breeding ground hornbills we can possibly get. Right, now, there we go. The reason why we know she's a female is if you look underneath her beak, you can see that there's a very or purpley colored patch just underneath the beak so you've got the red and then you've got that purple patch underneath so the females get that purple patch whereas the males just have a plain red facial patch or bare skin around that area so that's how we know she's a girl very cool though David, you say it's kind of sad that she's alone. Well, this is how new flocks form, is that these things have to happen. Is Birds have to distribute out and they have to go other places. And I can promise you if she keeps calling the way she's calling now, she will attract a male and a male will come in and she might form a whole new flock altogether. So even though it seems sad she's alone and calling, she will attract the attention of a flock at some point. There is a whole flock that lives in this area. And so maybe a young male will come out somewhere and join her and we can get some rope romance in the air at some point right now while we kind of carry on now that we've seen our beautiful ground hornbill let's send you across to ali who's picked up a beautiful predator for the morning we have but unfortunately it's decided now to head on to the wrong way so let's just be patient maybe it'll go around and carry on coming here but it's a beautiful spotted hyena now it was trolling working uh, its way down the road and I wonder where it's headed off to now. It seems like a youngish hyena will, at least it, its ears are not that tattered or from what I can see from here. So I don't know if anybody's gonna be able to recognize it from this very quick look. But if you do know who this hyena is or you know a little bit of her background, do let us know using the hashtag Safari Live. Because I, for one, have been missing the fact uh, that we don't have an active hyena den anymore. And it's always wonderful to go and spend time with them and just see their social structure and what they get up to. Yeah, I think they're very clever creatures. But this one has now decided to veer off the road and it has not come back onto it. So we're going to carry on down our path. Ooh. If I manage to get the car in gear and see if maybe we'll get a little bit of better luck. It's always nice. I haven't seen a hyena in a while, so it's good to see them and know that they still roam around these areas. Oh, now I think we have a bird of prey there. Senzo, I don't know if... Uh, nope, it's blown away. Now it looked like something small, so perhaps something like... Let me see if I can get the book. So it looked like something like a little gossip or perhaps even a shikra. Let's have a quick look so that you guys can see what I'm talking about. Now, I've, every time I've driven down this road, I think roughly in that area, I've been seeing the same one. So I, every time I look at it, it flies away very quickly. So I'm not too sure what it is just yet, but just judging from the way it was standing and from what I saw, because there was a lot of white, I'm wondering if it perhaps it wasn't a black-shouldered kite. 
Now, it would be unusual, as I haven't seen them here before, but just going by size, I think it would be because very, very prominent white breast, and you can see here when it sits down, that's all that you see, a very, very prominent breast, white breast. Whereas all of the other creatures, or the smaller birds that it could be, you see they all have stripes um, on their chest. So it would be tough to say who it was, but... I think I'm gonna put my money on that one. Bill chanting goes hook way too big for that little bird that I saw. And then now we're heading on to bigger creatures. So hmm. It would be interesting to see. And you see all of this one's a little sparrow hawk and then shikras and little creatures they all also have way too many stripes. So well, I think maybe we're gonna have to take my word for it that there was a lot of white and then it was a black shouldered kite. Very pretty ah little things. That hurt. But it has not come back to the tree and maybe it's just gonna... Yes? Okay. Maybe, did you spot a leopard? Yeah, can you see it? Okay. Okay, it seems like Senza has managed to spot the bird. I have no idea where it is. Ah, there we go. There you are. All right, now, definitely not a black shouldered kite then would be wonderful if you turned around a little bit. Let me just pull out my binoculars. See what color your eye is. Because I think we're looking at a black eye. Maybe something like a little sparrow hawk or a kabar ghost hawk even. Since I still don't know where you're looking at it. Let me see where you're pointing. <laughs> my goodness, it is a real drama of birding. Not only do you have to try and figure it out what they are, but you've got to try and see them. See this tree? This front one. Yeah. And there's a tamat mount. Yes. Yeah, that tree um, next to the tamat mount. Okay, the tree next to the termite mound. No, not this one. Your third place. This one? Yeah, this one. You yeah. Said, no? Your four o'clock one. Okay. Yeah, I'm gonna have to go with your great camera work because I'm not allowed to find it. All right, so it seems like you've got a red eye. Have you got a red eye? I'm tempted to say that this could be a shikra just because of that red eye. Kerr says that it looks like a black eye. Hmm. Now this is getting even more, more complicated. So let's have a look at the book and see what our different options are. Perhaps the barring of the tail will give it away for us. It's also something nice to look for when we're looking for smaller birds of prey. Now let's see what you've got. Lizard buzzard, hmm, could be, could be, but we would be able to see a bit of your throat. Let's turn, I'm still sticking with Kabar goshawk. Can you just, because it seems to be about the right size from what we're a shikra. Well, Byron, that was my, Byron thinks it's a shikra. That was my first thought. But then Kirsty says that she doesn't think that it's got a red eye, but a dark one. So I wish we could see it a little bit better. If it's got a dark eye, then I'm going to go with this one. Just because it's also got the barring of the tail. But now let's check the shikra quickly. Byron says that definitely a red eye. Well, if it had a red eye, then we definitely need to go with shikra. And the shikra would be this one. Tricky with this light to try and see. So you see birding, the light influences a lot what we can see and how we can identify birds. So you see the red ooh, the red eyed here and more cherry red eye. And all of the barring in the in the chest. Now I think we're gonna let Byron win and probably say that it's a shikra. And if not, then we can make up our own birds, which is always wonderful. Shikra was also my very first instinct, so we always have to we always have to trust our gut feeling. It seems like Byron is smiling in the tent. I think he likes winning, so let's head over to him. <laughs> not really, no, not really. But uh, I just want to make sure we are correct. But um, having a look at that image that Senzo managed to get for us, I have to agree with Elliot, is a shikra. Not just, uh, and I'll tell you why, what I'd like to show you here quickly. And it's a bit easier with this image. The other thing to look for, sorry, there we go, Fergus, is that better? That, that reddish eye, it had a slightly reddish eye. Sometimes it's not always that prominent, but what was prominent was that yellow sear on the beak. Do you have a look at that? That the yellow sear is that top part of the beak. 
So that, uh, oh, sorry, there we go. That um, was very clear. So you can also look for those little signs. The other, the Gabagos Hawk, um, I'll show you quickly. But um, and let me just see if there's another picture of the eyes. Uh, that's a juvenile. But sometimes you don't, you just see that little orange ring of the eye, and not always the bright red coloration. But I do think it was a shikra, um, also because of that seer. So let me just show you an image quickly of the Gabba Goshawk and why I say the Gabba, I don't think that was a Gabba. The Gabba is a little bit bigger and also um, it has that orange seer. You see that? And a very, very dark eye. I'm sure most of you agree with me. Sorry, Fergus, let me straighten. There we go. You see that? That is the Gabba Goshawk. I don't think it was the Gabba. It looked like... Uh, like the shikra to me if you have any ideas don't forget to let us know and uh and we'll have a look but i, th I think it was a shikra um it is sometimes tough to to uh gauge on uh, on the screen and there are a few things i need to catch up with now oh, we had a question about um the spiders so ali found that beautiful spider and we were wondering what it was i think I think it may have been a bark spider, but I'm not sure. It moved quite quickly, and we didn't get a good view. Uh, then there was a question about tarantulas, and do we have any tarant? Do we have any tarantulas, Vlad? You asked. Do we have any tarantulas in Africa? So we have got spe a species of, of spider which are considered to be tarantula, and that is, of course, the baboon spiders. Now let me show you. I have managed to Google baboon spiders already. Now have a look at that. That is a beautiful hairy baboon spider. And scientific name, Harpactera. There are a number of different species though, but this is, I think, the common baboon spider. And um, they are considered to be Africa's tarantulas. Very hairy, hairy spider. You can have, I mean, if you look, all those hairs along there. Very, very hairy, beautiful spiders. Now, how they got the name baboon spider, some of you might be wondering if you haven't heard before. But these two segments, um, and if I can point over here again, folks, sorry, these last two segments on the legs, that's a nice one over there. Those last two segments of the legs um, underneath appear to look like the fingers of baboons. And that is where they get the name baboon spider. So those last two segments there underneath just look very similar to that of a baboon's fingers. And apparently that is the theory of how the baboon spider got its name. Uh, what else are we looking at? There was that. There was uh, the hyena that Ali managed to see. Crocata, crocata. I knew that one. I knew that one. That is the spotted hyena. And... Uh, Obviously, it's always nice and fun to see hyena. I do, I do enjoy seeing hyena. Very interesting creatures. So this scientific name is Crocata Crocata. So, all right, sorry. I am um, struggling to hear Kirst a little bit today. But uh, we're going to head across to Tristan. I didn't hear what he has, but let's go and find out. I have a rather large dam, Byron, more water, just to make it kind of tie in with the theme. But at least our Biffleshook hippo has got a friend these days. So another hippo is in. It actually looks like it could even be a female and a young one. And then there are two little grebes that are floating about there, or dab chicks is what their old name was. They're also bouncing around in that area. And you can see Biffleshook Dam is full. It's much fuller than what it was. If you look on the sort of right side there where the grass is, you can actually see the grass is flooded and is in the water so whenever you see that you know that it has risen quite a bit so that's where the water has gone up and gotten a lot more in and this dam always fills up the fastest out of all of them luckily also this particular dam is one that we can actually drive on the dam wall because it's got such a massive dam wall it's not like the others there's our little grebes that we were talking about or dab chick is the old name and there are two of them is the one that's pottering about on the surface and then there's another one that's just popped up closer to the hippos and you see that they dive quite a bit so they kind of go along and then they dive down to go look for food so there they are yellow little ones very cool little birds i quite like them i think they're very cool 
These must be the same two that were down at Twin Dams for quite a while, and this is a far better habitat for them than Twin Dams. There's at least a lot more water, a lot more space to go swimming around and finding the food that they need. Now, I thought I saw a squacko heron as well around. Now, some of you might not know what a squacko heron is. I'll try and quickly have a little look if I can see it again. It's good weather though for birds. We're going to see maybe some interesting birds coming out, particularly things like crakes. So you'll find black crakes might come out, um, African crake, and if we were super, super, super lucky, we'd get maybe balions or spotted crake. But those would be very, 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 very rare. Right, now where did my squacko heron go? I think it's disappeared. It was on the, the right-hand side and it flew as we came. Mm, looks as though it's gone, unfortunately. And I don't have my binoculars with me because I don't want them to get wet. So I didn't bring them, but I can't see it. It's a, it, the squacko herons are quite light-colored, creamy white birds, and so we should be able to see it quite easily there. There's just a couple foam nest frogs' nests that are there, and that's it. So oh, thank you, Vildi. Vildi's giving me his binoculars so I can have a little quick look and see if I can spot this heron anywhere in the distance here. Let's quickly just get the focus right. So no, VM, I don't see it. I think it's flown away, unfortunately. It got a bit of a fright as we came around the corner, and so that's why it disappeared. But sometimes they fly up into the vegetation on the sort of banks. Oh, there it is. I've got it. Them on the left-hand side of the branch sticking out of the water. And yes, yeah, straight in. Straight in to your left a little bit. A little bit to your left. More, 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 more. On the bank, there it is. So it is sitting on the bank itself. So there's our squacko heron, which is very cool to see. They're not that common for us here. We don't see them all that regularly because, well, it's also been very dry. Once we have water, then we see them a lot more and we'll kind of pick them up. So there it is sitting out in the open for all of us, which is very, very cool. Now we'll find them often at water points like this. They like to go into where there's flooded sections. It's easy for them to go and hunt frogs and various other things. And so I would imagine that we'll see maybe a few more of them. We might also start to see a few of the bitterns coming out along the fringes of these water holes that are flooded and we should maybe even see some of the herons coming in so purple herons maybe or goliath herons at Chitra Dam if there's enough food sources for them. The squacko heron though is a cool bird because I'll try and get a picture of it because I know it's quite far away but I quite like them I think they've got cool colors on them so just trying to find a picture for all of you. So basically that's what we're looking at over there. It's a bird that gets this bright blue beak, which is very, very cool. It's like a kind of powder bright blue color with this yellow eye and then this creamy coloration of a few little stripes and then a very white wing. They often get confused with egrets, cattle egrets in flight because of how white they are. And you can see them kind of flying along there. I'm sure I've got one of them sitting. Yes, there's sitting over there. So very pretty little heron. And we see them quite, like I say, quite commonly, especially in the Kruger, you see a lot of them that side. Very, very nice. Thank you, VM, for your binoculars. Without them, we would not have seen the squacker heron. Very good. Right, now I'm going to carry on, see if I can find anything else. I, I mean, I don't really know where else to go and look. I think I'm just going to bumble about and go and maybe check some other water points. Maybe we'll head towards the treehouse side. And while we do that, let's send you across to Ali, who's doing exactly what I'm doing and bumbling about. Well, exactly. Bumbling about seems about right in this weather conditions, just because we're also quite limited in eruptions. Not too sure where the animals could have gone. We haven't really seen much. Other after we saw that chikra, everything else has been fairly quiet. So I imagine the birds are also very, very wet. There was a cocky Franklin calling in the distance, but too far in the distance, so we couldn't really see it. Now I'm going down to Takat line and I am hoping that maybe perhaps Tandi has decided to come a little bit onto this side of the road and that would be great. Otherwise, I think I'm going to head on to Chitwa, see what's happening around there. Because I think between Tristan and I will manage to cover all of Juma fairly quickly. <laughs> but it's good, it's almost like a great, uh, you know, just getting to know a whole new place. And it's quite interesting because all the roads have been wiped down and only now can we see some of the tracks because the sand is still soft. But later on today, if the sun shines, then I reckon we're going to have a little bit more of trouble trying to find anything. Now, let's have a look at what we're looking at these tracks here because it's the only tracks that we can see out in the road. 
and it's human tracks funny enough so I would imagine that Tristan and yeah and lion tracks too old lion tracks here on the side of the road and then more human tracks so let me just go further down the road because the lion tracks are old just, hmm. I wonder if perhaps Tristan has been walking down here and now we've got some more running creatures somebody it seems like zebras have been running around here that's actually what it looks like instead of a human truck now I'm making drama for nothing now the general shape is this one let me just show you guys and why I think it's this particular one Ooh. this one is this one good for you this one so it's very hard to tell in with the sand and the condition that the sand is in now but we've got this very particular shape which already gives us an indication as to what it is and in some of them you can even see this little triangle that is at the back of the zebra track so that's the easiest way to tell a zebra track and I think Tristan is close to where Tandy was so it could be that this is where those guys came from and then they were just running down the road I think that is probably what our mystery tracks are and perhaps Tristan saw them earlier on and also jumped down to have a look maybe that's exactly what happened now they've gone they carry on down the road and we already saw those zebras so I'm going to pass by and then we're gonna stop for good leopard tracks fresh leopard tracks or lion tracks that would be ideal now you see here are lion tracks again going going up the road just have a look getting a little bit puzzling so maybe Tristan should have a closer look all the way in Buffalo Dam so they're older and you can see one here one here one toe here and then one other toes here and then going down the road so it's quite interesting but also something else that's caught my eye is another massive creature that's roaming around here since I think you'll be able to get it look how big this millipede is it's almost the size of my foot this is by far the biggest one I have ever seen you are big. Are you heading into the vegetation now? Well, I wouldn't be walking around here if I were you. Huh. Very, very interesting. It is definitely one of the biggest ones that I've seen. And unlike the centipede, this one is a lot friendlier and will feed on vegetation. Now, it seems like there are a few things happening here. And also, pretty little flower. I'm just going to try and put it this way so that it faces the camera. This little one, it's been quite common all around uh, Juma. I've actually seen it a lot and uh, scientific name Byron you can try and help us find this one I do know it's a comelina and that's the common name or one of the common names is blue comelina but also and I have no idea why it's also called the wandering Jew <laughs> very very unlikely name I'm not too sure where it came from but it seems like many things were happening in there oh all right carry on and see what bless you what else has been happening at, down this road I know could be perhaps that the lions came here and that's where we saw them roaring so I know Tristan is in Buffalo's of Dam so very likely he can have a look around that area Jimmy you're wondering if the millipedes are poisonous yes they are they are covered or their shell the exoskeleton um, is covered in a substance that's called cyanide so it's one of the reasons why not too many animals can actually feed off of them because of this protective poison that is on top of them however certain animals like the civet seem to eat millipedes and really they are not bothered by the poison they seem to be immune to it but when you see baboons eating them also you'll see that they'll go and scrub them against the, the rocks just to get this layer off and then they'll eat them Ooh. there we go All right, Byron, here's your challenge, Latin name for millipede. Off we go to Byron, see what he says. Oh no, Ellie, you're throwing me off, you're throwing me off. You asked for the Latin name of a blue comelina. That's comelina, uh, communis, comelina communis, the blue comelina Asiatic dayflower. That's also what it's known as, beautiful blue comelina. I do enjoy seeing them, I saw a few 
yesterday. Um, but I'll quickly look for um, the millipede and see if we can get a um, scientific name. Uh, well, Diplopoda, okay, oh, that's a class. That's, uh, let's see if there's anything. Millipedes, arthropods. Um, millipedes, legs, bones. Lacme, Lacme plenipes. Uh, we're down here. Latin for 1,000 feet, record of 750. Lacme plenipes is a species. I think they're different species of millipedes. You know, a lot of L's there. Lacme plenipes. <laughs> um, all right, but there's, I've got, <laughs> I've got a, a, lot to, a lot to speak about, actually, because... Um, okay, firstly, we'll get back to the millipede and the centipede. But um, I did manage to find uh, one of the alates that's obviously lost its wings now. So I'll put it back. But Tristan was speaking about these yesterday. Um, these alates that uh, fly around after the rain and, um, and then try to set up colonies. So this will be a, a male or female that then will mate and try to set up a new colony of termites. After the rain, the soil is very, very soft and it's easy for them to burrow. So this is uh, uh, one that has lost its wings. So they don't ha hold their wings for very long. Sometimes they can fly for a few meters and then uh, and then lose the wing. Um, I wonder, should we try the microscope first? I don't know if it's going to... Microscope. microscope. Did I say microscope? <laughs> I apologize. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the Latin for microscope is microscope. <laughs> All right, wait, let me see if I can get this little guy or girl under the microscope here quickly. Oh, no, blurry safaris. James always shouts at me when I get this wrong. Fergs, I think this might be quite tricky because... Ooh. No, it's moving. It's moving, so it's not, I'm, I'm not going to... I'm not going to even bother trying to get it on the microscope for you because I think you will just get frustrated and so will I. Um, but um, but wonderful to see those alates around and, and a great food source. We were discussing it yesterday, a great food source for a lot of creatures. And I mentioned in December I saw an interesting little animal feeding on them. And I have a look at this. So let me see if I can get that is the image I managed to capture of this beautiful um, Epistophthalmus granulatus scorpion and you can actually see some uh, wings around the mouth there but have a look at this I'll show you another image there we go see how it's caught the um, caught the uh, alate in its pincers and it stings it. it it would sting it very very quickly and then feed on Sorry, Fergus, all right? And then feed on the alate. Look at that. Isn't that incredible? It was fascinating to watch. And luckily, it was during the day. So we were just standing around watching the scorpion go about his business feeding on these alates, catching them with his pincers. They were super quick. Run as the alates are running around. The scorpion would run, grab them with the pincers. Tail would come over, sting it very quickly, and then feed on it. And then um, the other thing that I found wonderful which i've never seen before was not far was a female and this female had her young on their back so the scorpions carry their young on their back have a look at that isn't that amazing really fascinating all those little baby scorpions on the back of the female and this female was also catching alates at the same time so she had the young on her back they just hung on really tight and she would catch, and look at the size of those pincers, very strong, powerful pincers. They're quite intimidating scorpions, but they're beautiful. Those golden brown colors. So that was really wonderful to see. I loved seeing that. And then um, I was, we were chatting about the, the millipede that Ali saw, and I had a, another interesting, very interesting sighting of uh, centipede. 
Now, I know Ali was uh, chatting about the difference between centipedes. Centipedes have or usually flatter bodies, not those round bodies like a millipede. And also the centipedes only have uh, um, two or a single pair of legs per segment. So two legs per segment on the body, whereas millipedes will often have um, two or more pairs per segment of legs. So have a look at this. This is an interesting little video that I... See that centipede managed to capture a mapani moth and was feeding on it. But look at the colors of that centipede. The pink and sorry, folks, let me try play that again. There we go. Yeah, and this is also something I managed to film um, just about two, two weeks ago, three weeks ago. I was up in Botswana and got to see that. So, um, it was, um, yeah, very, very interesting. And it's wonderful to have a look out for interesting little creatures like this. And at the moment, um, in, in that part of Botswana, in the Thule block, there were loads of Mapani moths around. I haven't seen Mapani moths down here. We don't have any Mapani trees here uh, that I can think of. I don't know. No, I don't think the Sabi sands, maybe in some sections, but not many Mapani trees, but huge. The Mapani moths are massive. They're about this big, very, very large. Actually, let me show you an image of one. I caught uh, an image um, of one of those Mopani moths just quickly, just to show you how spectacular they are. Have a look at that. Isn't that beautiful? So you see those very prominent markings on the wings? And they are big moths. They really, really are big. Um, as I said, wingspan, they're about that size. Those Mopani moths and that big centipede managed to capture one and feed on it. So some interesting things out there. Now let's go across to Ali and find out what interesting things she has found or is going to find. Well, for now, it seems like only doves flying right in front of us. And they're just, they fly a little bit, they stop on the road and then they fly a little bit more and then they stop again on the road. Seems like we, there are more reports for a male lion somewhere around Chitwa. There's a ringneck dove. So Tristan is following up on the lion tracks that I had in that area because it's close to Bufuzuk Dam where he was. And I'm just going to carry on going south, see if perhaps we do, <laughs> if it works to divide and conquer and maybe we'll be able to see some lions at some point <laughs> during today's drive. That would be pretty magical to see a lion in this rain and see how they feel. Well, although it's not raining that much, luckily. But I'm too afraid to call the rain off and say that we're not going to get wet at any point today because the sky is still looking very, very dark. Now, the doves are still in front of us and now they've flown away. Thank you. Wouldn't really want to squash anybody today. And it's one of the tricky things in the summertime, especially after the rain when you're driving. You're just terrified because many things are going to come into the roads. And yesterday evening, even when we were driving back from camp back to Inges, which is the other house where we live, we could see millions of tiny little frogs trying to cross the road and you know we knew that they were there so it's hard because you obviously don't want to squash anyone so i'm hoping they all survived just to live another day and by the sounds of it with all the frogs that tristan found in that one specific spot it seems like frogs are doing quite well and it's probably the reason why they're called a keystone species or an environment indicator more than a keystone species hmm. ooh, ooh. Snazzy, you're wondering if colored frogs are dangerous to humans. Well, they definitely can be, and they can be dangerous probably because there is some sort of poison. So a lot of things in nature, when they have a very bright color, then you at least have to take a double look and guess at what you're, you know, just doubt yourself at what you're seeing, because more likely than not, these bright colors are a warning. Almost like, you know, we have the signs in red that say danger. It's pretty much the same in nature. So they are warning already any potential predator. If you want to eat meat, likely you're going to get sick. So go and choose somebody else pretty much the way it works and you've got to be careful when handling any creature that might have a bright color uh, we are almost down at Gary remain which is good we haven't been able to see any tracks for tandy no more lion tracks nothing so who knows hmm. seems like there was a tree that has been pushed a little bit by the elephants or perhaps it's just the ground no this is Ooh. oh look 
This is very pretty. These are the pods of this particular terminalia. It just almost looks like it's a purple pod. Very, very beautiful. Huh, hello little ones. Right, seems like Tristan is back on the vehicle, so let's head over to him and have an update. Perhaps he's had a little bit more luck with the lions. No, no luck as yet. We went and had a look quickly at those lion tracks that Ali saw earlier and just to see what was going on and whether or not they were worth following. Now, it looks as though they are from last night during the rain. They cannot be before the rain, or I mean after the rain, because they are very heavily washed, but every other track on every other road has been completely destroyed if it was prior to the rain. So we know that those lines moved up and down there yesterday morning, but I think these are from sort of during the course of the night, and they've early night is what I would have said but there's no sort of sign of where they went so what I'm going to do is just do Drakensberg Road southwards and see if we can pick up anything the zebra tracks there are much fresher than the lion tracks so it's not the same incident where the zebras are running I don't think I might be wrong but I don't think so the zebras are a nice fresh track after the rain whereas the you know the lion tracks like I say are completely washed out so we'll just check around and see it's interesting also it only looks like for two individuals so I don't know who it could be maybe it's amber eyes and the young female they often are together and moving around and walking around together it didn't look like male lines it looked like two females that were together there so also maybe the sticks females they could have also been around we know that there are three of them um, I suppose it could be that even that Imbiri line is just going up and down could be her I mean, we have no idea where she went she was down on the southern boundary and just disappeared so that could make sense because it looks like the tracks go up and down I thought it was two but I suppose it could be one if it's moving up and down maybe interesting either way she'll be a lot harder to find than a whole pride I was also saying to VM that I'm pretty sure that any lion that is anywhere in this vicinity is probably not lying in grass. If I was a lion, I would be on the road. That's where I would be, just lying on the, the sort of damp sand rather than the soaking wet grass that we've got this morning. Uh, there should be a beautiful male Nyala here. There it is. Is that gap all right, VM? So there we go. There's our beautiful bull Nyala who is looking as glorious as glorious could be it doesn't even look as though there's even been a drop of rain he's got his coat is all sorted out he obviously prepped himself quite nicely and you can see those big horns that go up with those little white tips and then that long shaggy coat that they have they are really are beautiful animals and very impressive when they these big males like this and they get all this long fur and then like I say that's a serious set of horns on this particular male very very long they're not the widest spread but they are very long horns that he's got so he's a fine looking fella and is in good a condition as you could ask for but they've got that characteristic white marking or chevron below the eyes which is what we see on pretty much all of the males in this family group so bushbuck nyala and kudu they all have that white chevron it just seems to stand out that much more than nyala because of their darker fur as a male you just kind of see that white contrasting a lot more underneath the eyes now the theory behind it is much the same as lions and leopards having lighter marking just to help bring more light into the eyes and you'd wonder well, maybe why a Nyala would need that well Nyalas also need it because they spend a lot of time in dark shady areas so it's you know it's difficult for them to see in there so it helps with that it also helps just to break the outline of their face so when they're in a thicket where there's a lot of dappled light those white chevrons can just help kind of break up the face itself and help them blend in a little bit better but when we talk about blending in look at that in one second from visible to pretty much gone and it's only gone behind one tree that's all it is absolutely amazing now there's something fluttering about down at the bottom of my car here that I don't know what it is what is this hold on Ow! hey don't bite me that's nasty of you now I found us a dung beetle so I'm just trying to get it for you and it is crawling around down in the pits of rusty and is now caught in the cabling there we go. Alright, little guy. So there's our dung beetle. 
Kristen, you were wondering about dung beetles and when they would come out after this rain. Well, there we go. So they'll start coming out immediately and they'll start being quite busy. But this is a really cool one. He's a little bit kind of sort of unsure of where to go at the moment. There's a situation where it's kind of been in the pits of Rusty for a while and probably is now just seeing the light of day and so it's just orientating itself as to where to go. But you can see that shovel-shaped head that is typical of all dung beetles. They kind of are able to do, use that to then dig up soil and dirt and even dung as they root around and try and roll their balls out. Big, strong, powerful legs that they've got those little spikes on that just make them a little harder to eat. And then that very hard shell that they've got and kind of rounded appearance. But look at how the antenna are working, just trying to see what's going on. And then those eyes just on the side of the head as well. Now, it's really cool to have these guys around. I absolutely love dung beetles. I find them absolutely fascinating. The way that they can use all kinds of different things to be able to find their way. So they are apparently able to use the stars as well as the sun to orientate themselves, which is pretty cool. I wonder if that's maybe why they get a bit confused on cloudy days. It's a little harder to work out where the sun is. Excuse me. I had to sneeze there. Now, there goes our little dung beetle. Oh, not the cleverest of dung beetles. Right, I'm going to get our dung beetle out and onto the ground where it's able to go and find itself some food. There we go, dung beetle. Okay, good. Dung beetle is gone. It is now in its natural environment, not on Rusty. So hopefully it will find itself some pile of poo to go and roll around in. And while we do that, or while it does that and we carry on, let's send you back across to Byron who hopefully will not be doing what a dung beetle will be doing and will be showing you something far more interesting instead. Well, we've just also got some Mignola outside of the tent and um, they, they've been wandering around. We've had um, Wildebeest walk past a number of Mignola and there's actually quite a few very close to us at the moment. And you see how wonderfully they are browsing. You can actually see the ropes of the tent. They're right outside. Fascinating and wonderful to have them around here. As I was saying with them browsing at the moment, obviously there's so much moisture around that they're getting a lot of water from the leaves that they're feeding on. And nice to see them around here. Now Tristan has showed you that beautiful dung beetle now. Um, I was reading up a little bit about them recently because there have been a few um, fairly new theories with the dung beetle and um, and basically on how they navigate uh, this. And I think uh, we put a question through a while ago about it and if anybody else has heard anything. But um, a researcher in, I think, Sweden, I think it was, um, said, now, from what, firstly, let's start, what, what I've always learned um, and uh, what James taught me, so let's blame James for this, um, but, uh, but I always remember that dung beetles, often, firstly, when you see them rolling the ball around, you see them stop and often the male will run up to the top of the ball and then he shuffles around and he'll turn and this is to try and navigate so they know which direction they're going and they use the sun. That's what I've always learned is they use the sun. Um, but now apparently uh, someone has done a study and again I don't know how accurate this is but they believe that um, they use the stars but more so the Milky Way. So the Milky Way gives a, I suppose it does let off a lot of light uh, and apparently they are still able to pick up the light of the Milky Way. Now, I don't know if this is during the day. It wouldn't make sense to me. Um, you know, it's easy for them to stand on the dung ball, see the sun moving, and then and then navigate that way. Um, even on cloudy conditions, you can still kind of make out where the light is mo the, the strongest. Um, now, there are many different species of dung beetles, so perhaps the different dung beetles have different ways of of um, orientating themselves and moving around, and maybe there are some that are um, active at night, nocturnal dung beetles, which is not impossible. I think there are a few different species, but there are many different species. So um, I think both theories are plausible, that they use the sun and then the light of the Milky Way during the evening. But um, it, it's it's... It sounds unlikely at times, some of these theories, and I wonder how they prove them, but 
it is interesting nonetheless and it's always nice to talk about on uh, on safari live and share them with you but uh, don't forget if you want to share or ask more questions about us let us know hashtag safari live but in the meantime let's go back across to the latin queen ali and find out what she's up to well we are very close to chitwa dam but we got <laughs> we looked in this direction and we could see something and i wasn't sure from the distance if it was actually a nest just by the way it was hanging but it turns out it's the fish eagle that lives at the dam now it's standing in that very funny way with its um, wings exposed like that probably because it's trying to dry out so as you can see humans and, and birds and just creatures are like we're all trying to dry it out after the torrential rain we had yesterday that lasted well into early hours of the morning so the eagle i'm sure it's hoping for some sunlight to try and dry itself a little bit it's going to be a bit of a tricky tricky thing this one but at least it's got um there's, you know, it's dry environment. It's almost like hanging a jacket on, on a tree and then you're able to just make sure that it dries out for a little bit longer or dry out at all. Huh. Sorry, um, there's another bird that we haven't seen in quite a while, Sanzon. It just caught my eye because it started moving and I could see the white. Do you see there to the left, so straight in front of you, do you see that white moving in the distance? amongst the green trees. Okay. Just gonna try and go away because it's another one that at least I haven't seen in this area for a while. It is a common species of bird and it's not an eagle. Here we go. There we go. Hello Woolly Next Stork. Nice to see you. <laughs> Thankfully it's got a very white clean head that is allowing us to see it properly at this time because had it just stood still and with its head tucked away somewhere else we wouldn't have been able to see it so you see it's also drying out just exactly as the eagle was doing i think most of the birds are going to take to the top of the branches of the tree or go onto dead trees like the eagle did just to try and, and hang in there until the water evaporates a little bit from their feathers now there's a bit of a slight breeze and it's slightly warmer than what it was before so it's not like they're not going to be able to fly but obviously if they're too weight that impairs their ability to be able to fly and it was quite funny yesterday i was looking at a bird that um was trying to fly and as it was flying away it almost seemed to be struggling and then it was like no no no, too much and then went back to the same branch where it was hanging in so i think all of these creatures are enjoying now the fact that the rain has finally stopped. Now, in terms of interesting updates, which I forgot to say in the beginning, is that the Molo Wanini is flowing. <laughs> How is that? We actually had to cross the water, had to go into low range. It was very cool. But it uh, seems like we had no signal in that area. But on our way back, definitely going to check the Molowati, uh, as it might also be flowing a little bit. I'm not too sure if Tristan... Uh, managed to have a look at the Molowati this morning. I'm not sure if he actually went down that area. I do remember he was roughly into the southern part of Juma, but I don't remember if he went there. And it'll be, it'll be nice to see if that actually happened. Now, those rivers that we cross are more drainage lines than anything else. They're dry riverbeds and they only flow once or twice a year. But I think yesterday with the amount of rain that we had, it was a great moment to start raining because there's almost this massive cloud on top of, well, on top of pretty much all of the eastern side of South Africa at the moment. So we have had lots and lots of rain that have been able to fuel the water that's coming down here not only from what we've gotten here but also from further up north where these reeds uh, where these reeds where these rivers actually originate from so i would really like for the molowati to be flowing as i've never seen it flow before that would be very cool very very cool i think we're going to leave these poor two birds that are looking a little bit gloomy and then we're going to carry on down the road and see what else we can find around there seems like the reports for lions were true so hopefully we'll be able to go and have a look but while i do that let's go to byron and find out what the latin name for a fish eagle is oh dear latin name for fish eagle i'll have to look that up can't remember what uh oh no i'll have to look that up i'll find it for you quickly uh fish eagle african fish eagle uh Heli heliitis vocifer let me see if i can show you that word it's quite tricky uh there we go 
Uh, I'm sorry, folks. Helia, Helia, Yitas, Vasifa. Because it sounds like I'm trying to sing. I hope my singing doesn't sound like that. James will probably say it does. Um, but uh, I just wanted to show you we found uh, a blue comelina outside the tent. And uh, Judy H., let's go to the microscope. There we go. Look at that. Judy H., um, thank you. Uh, I think you were saying that uh, it's comelina erectus. I think this species of comelina. There are a few uh, different species of comelina. So not the one that we found on uh, Wikipedia, which we know is not always correct. But um, but this, I think, is Comelina erectus. So thank you, Judy H., as always. But beautiful, beautiful little flower. And lovely to see this Comelina under the microscope. It had little droplets of water on it, too, obviously, with all the rain. The rain is still around. It's still drizzling at the moment. But um, but it is quite, uh, quite beautiful. Um, now, uh, earlier, just doing the birds that uh, that uh, we have uh, been going through, Tristan had that wonderful ground hornbill that was standing and calling beautifully for us. So let's find the ground hornbill um, scientific name. Bucorvus leadbeatery. <laughs> let's see. I'm, do you agree with uh, my pronunciation? Hold on. We're getting there. Uh, Fergus is growling. That was not a li lion. <laughs> Bucorvus leadbeatery. Leadbeatery. I. I. Leadbeatery. Now I'm going to keep quiet for a second because I heard something calling. I think it was a wildebeest. Let's have a look quickly. Follow me. Sorry. I'm sure I heard the grunt of a wildebeest somewhere. Perhaps, perhaps it was around that side. But as you can see, it is still drizzling here. So I'm very happy to be in the tent. And I think it might be coffee time. So while I pour myself a coffee, let's go across to Tristan, find out how the rain is treating him. While some are making coffee and sitting all cozy, some of us are starting to get wet. It's starting to rain again now, and I think the rain's going to come quite hard. There's a big dark grey cloud to my left that is blowing in, and it seems as though that might be bringing more of the wet stuff towards us. So I think what we're going to do is start heading away from the grey cloud. And, and since we've worked this eastern side all morning with very little luck, I think what we're going to do is probably start heading to the western side a little bit and just see, you never know, maybe something pops out for us on the western side. So I want to go just past roughly where Treehouse is. We can't drive over Treehouse Dam Wall, so we'll just go kind of along the side of the dam and go and see what's happening there. And then up towards maybe Philemon's and then up towards Quarantine and see, maybe something is around. Maybe Tamba or Hukumuri or one of them could be lurking about the place. But what we did have just now, which was quite cool, is we had a little a red billed hornbill that found itself a earthworm. It managed to dig an earthworm out of the sort of ground. Yeah, I mean, it shoved its beak into the ground and an earthworm came up. And so it picked it up and it was flying around with it. But of course, like birds are, it just didn't want to sit still long enough for us to actually put it on camera and show all of you so it kind of kept flying away with the worm stuck in its mouth and i'm sure that worm by now is in the belly of a red-billed hornbill as gary you're asking if we have night crawler worms no i've no, i've never seen night crawler worms here i don't know i mean well I'm saying no like I, I know this for sure, but I have never heard of nightcrawler worms or even been told about nightcrawler worms in this part of the world. So I don't think so. Maybe Byron might know a bit more and once he's finished making his coffee, 
he can look into it, but I, I don't think so. I, like I say, I've never heard of it. Nobody's ever told me about nightcrawler worms. So I would imagine that we don't get them here and we do not see them at all. Now, actually, that's quite cool. There's some fungi and not Byron, not a fungi, but some fungi, should I say, then that will make it better. Here we go. Hopefully I didn't drive over all of it. No, I didn't. So there we go. There's a whole bunch of them growing out of a pile of elephant dung. So even though the Ellies have all kinds of destructive capabilities, you can see lots of good things too. So in elephant dung, there's these fungus that grow out of them, and so that allows the fungus to live. Then you've got dung beetles that are feeding off them, various insects, the birds that feed off those insects. So it's a whole micro-ecosystem when an elephant defecates. You can see also remains of a marula seed in the background as well. Now, some of these are still forming and are very fresh. Others have already deposited their spores all over the place, and it's amazing how many spores come out of a single fungus like that. We also have another little friend on our... Is this too close, VM, or is that okay? So we have a little instar of a cricket or grasshopper that is just doing a little sizing up of the monotech. I wonder if it can see itself and is now wondering why there's a massive cricket near it or and like I say grasshopper that's near it I should say grasshopper it's not a cricket it is a grasshopper so I wonder if it's kind of looking at that thinking well there's another massive one that looks just like me but that is definitely a little instar so it's the first kind of phase of this little one's life and it will get a bit bigger you can see short stubby antenna and big eyes oh that's water Be careful of that don't drown please no, it won't drown on that though, it will all be good. And then those massive, well-developed legs that are used to be able to jump around. And this one has got a very slow and steady movement to it. Very cool little thing though. Just goes to show, even when it's rainy like this, and we haven't had much luck with the bigger animals, there's so much to see after a rainy period. You get all these little things that start coming out, and it's wonderful to have so many you know, grasshoppers and insects and all kinds of other things around. So we're going to leave our little grasshopper there. It can enjoy the ride as we go along. I'm pretty sure it's not going to stay there, but we'll just let it hang out with us, and hopefully it will enjoy the rest of the show. It's got a perfect view of the show from where it is, well, from Rusty's show, because it can see everything that Rusty does as we go along. Right, now I believe Byron, who's topped up on coffee, is very efficient and has already got his his technique down in how to search about nightcrawler worms and apparently he's found what they are and so he's let's send you across to him so he can tell us all about them well i hope so the coffee is ready cheers for our morning coffee everyone um and i was just having a look up or oh, looking for that little grasshopper that Tristan managed to find. I find those little grasshoppers beautiful and they, they really are interesting to to view. And I think it's funny, but I think it was a, a, perhaps a bladder grasshopper. And I think that's exactly what Tristan managed to find. Is that right? Sorry, the light. Is it right? Was it along the lines of that? I think so. There's uh let's see if there's a letter name that i can find for you um they in the family numeri day numeridae numeridae that's it numeridae uh, bladder grasshoppers um numoria inanus inanus yeah Anyway, it's very confusing. I'm, these scientific names, I think my brain's going to explode soon. Um, oh, quickly, let's go to Ellie. She's found something interesting. Well, we have found something, and oh my goodness, just, it seems like there has been a lot of folding. There we go, there's the lion contact calling. Now, he's at the bottom of the tree, but just as we arrived and we couldn't actually see a lot of the commotion, we just saw the lion quickly running. And the reason for it is because at the top of this tree, just a little bit, are you gonna go up? I think he's gonna go up. I think the, oh, okay, stretching. Now, the roof is getting in our way, so I'm not going to move now so that we don't get in the way of the animal's movements or the lion's movements. But on the top of this tree, there's a kill. And it seems like it's perhaps an impala. 
and perhaps and that impalakil was put up there by Tingana. So the lion actually managed to chase Tingana and Tingana managed to run down and then it's gone further off. So luckily the lion didn't get Tingana but I think there is still a lot of tension up in the air and he could definitely see the kill but whoop, just guarding it now. Ooh. What? This is this has been quite an incredible thing. I'm just gonna go forward, see if maybe we can have a look at the lion once more. All right. <laughs> Yo. Right, he is happy and settled here. Tingana's that way. Apple leaf. Okay. I'm gonna go have a look. Right, I think everybody is, and sorry we're going back and forth, but I'm pretty sure everybody's quite wanting to know how Tingana is doing. So I'm just going to go a little bit further, apparently he ran up a tree. So let's just head onto this particular tree, if it's the apple leaf, it's got to be this one. Somewhere around here, unless he's decided to move a little bit further. So hopefully we'll be able to see good old Tingana. All right, not, oh, there it is. Oh, I don't know how we're gonna show you guys this because he is right at the top of the tree. A further, all right, I think Senza might be able to work his magic. So lucky for us, Tingana managed to have a meal. And again, I apologize for the poles and everything else. So unfortunately, due to the rain that we have to put the rain covers, but you can see the tail of the leopard up there and he's facing in the direction where the lion is but I think he just ran all the way up to the tree for safety because the lion did duck and started running after him but Tingana's very quick so he knew exactly where to go up for safety and he knew that rather than carry on running maybe because the lion is bigger maybe it was just easier to go up the tree it's the safest place for a leopard to probably be in because uh, I don't think that lion would be able to climb that tree whatsoever and if it did it would probably fall under its weight I think in this sense, Tingana has a bit more of the advantage. Oh, shame boy, you can't even make a kill and have nobody eat it. <laughs> hmm. He is watching his skill. He knows it's still there. It can see it from 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 his vantage point, and the lion is just at the bottom of the tree. He's lying down, so I don't think Tingana is gonna try to go back down and climb up the tree, at least not with the lion there. And I think the tree might be a little bit too wet for the lion to even try and, and go up. Whew. You can hear the lion still in the distance, maybe. It's just, I'm just gonna be quiet for a little second. There is a car that's moving, but hopefully it'll stop soon and then we'll be able to hear the lion contact calling. Every now and again we hear it, whew, whew. Oh, Tingana, what a fright you gave us. All I could hear on the radio was that there was a lion chasing a leopard, but I'm very happy to know that the leopard is up and safe. Yeah, I do think he got a few bites in case some of you think are thinking about this too. It does, it could also be the angle, but it seems like his belly is a little bit full. So it, it's got almost that roundness that they get. So I am hoping, I'm hoping that he managed to get a few bites in here and there. And now judging from what we saw at the kill earlier on, I think it, I think he might have. Um, we can't show you the kills for for now, and the reason for it is because it's thick around that particular tree, but also because the only point where we can see it is actually where the lion is lying down. So <laughs> we can't really push him away to have a to have a view of the of the kill. Now it looked like an impala, judging by the rib cage that I saw or something. It looked like like a good meal. And just the ribs were exposed. So I think Tingana could have had a nice bite throughout the day. And well yesterday we know that he got a monitor lizard. So very exciting that he's managed to have a bite. Now Byron is still braving the tent, so let's head over to him and find out if he's got any cool fun facts for us today. Well, I've found some fun facts of the ANC, the African night crawler, and it is in fact a, a um, earthworm. So yes, we do get them in Africa, um, and I don't know exactly, there are many different species of earthworms, but I don't know. This uh, says that um, 
that they, um, I think, mainly in regions of West Africa, so not really here. But I, I wouldn't be surprised if there is, is a, a species of night crawler down here. So obviously very, very, um, let's just say due to the voracious appetites and ability to quickly reproduce, African night crawlers are quickly gaining popularity with uh, vermicomposters. So they obviously breaking down of uh, compost and that, which is amazing. So yeah, a huge uh, benefit for nature and they fill a very important role. Now, James is James Henry is apparently watching at the moment all the way in Kenya. Um, he must be very, very lonely and very, very bored if he's watching me. And um, apparently he requested a song for the African night crawler um, because he was mocking my singing earlier and he asked if I could sing something about the night crawler. Uh, okay, James, you asked for it. You cannot blame me for this one. Um, let's go. Uh, what do you think, Fergs? Night crawler moving around at night. Night crawler giving the girls a fright because you're a worm. <laughs> hey, hey, well, there we go. Maybe James can write a song about it now. And I hope that song gets stuck in his head while he's up in the Mara. <laughs> All right, let's go quickly across to Tristan and see how his drive's going. Well, Byron, our drive is fine. We just got into Treehouse right now. I've just come up, so I want to just move forward so the pole's out the way. There we go. Now we can at least see what Treehouse Dam looks like. A lot fuller than what it was a few days ago, that's for sure. It's filled up quite nicely, and it's not, I mean, it's not absolutely bursting at the banks, but definitely a lot better off than it was a few weeks ago. Also, no sign of anything at Treehouse Dam. I didn't really expect there to be any animals at the dam itself. There's no need for any animal to come towards the dam. It is at the end of the day, you know, a rather rainy time and so there's no water needed. But there's a beautiful woodland kingfisher that's always around at Treehouse Dam. It seems to be a pair of them that sit here regularly and they kind of dive bomb into the water to wash and grab insects and various other things that hang around in and around the dam area. Good. I think let's carry on. Let's see if we can explore a little further. I want to go up Zoe's road just from a point of view of maybe Shadulu's around. I know she crossed back to the west not yesterday, the day before. So you never know. Maybe she's come back on this side and we get lucky. What's interesting me though is that there's a blacksmith lapwing that is making a serious amount of noise and I'm wondering why. They generally only make noise like this if there's something wrong or something that's kind of up around in terms of a predator. So maybe there's a bird of prey somewhere here. They're not dive bombing anything, so... I'll stop now so you can hear what I'm talking about. It's quite loud and there's actually one of them is right here. So they're both just calling at each other and like I say they generally only do this when they have been disturbed for some reason but I do not see anything. Maybe they're just intruders that are fighting at the moment. Maybe that's what this is all about. Difficult to say. What is very interesting is if you look onto the other side of this dam, VM, if you can come back for me, just on the edge of this water point here. So there you see there's a little kind of spit of land where that three-banded plover is crossing. Now the other day we had that Imbiri female, she drank there and I drove to the left of that water point, which you can now see is absolutely covered in water. So where I drove is now part of Treehouse Dam and is not drivable anymore. Just gives you an idea of how much water has filled up since then. Anyway, we are going to carry on. Like I said, we're going to check around on Zoe's Road. While we do that, let's send you back across to Alley and the beautiful big male lion. Beautiful big male lion it is. Although I think he is <laughs> wanting to go up the tree and perhaps it's not going to be that ideal because the tree is very wet and he, he might slip. So I think that's the only reason why he hasn't tried to go all the way up. Now in terms of male lions, I, 
I would assume that this one is Mfuma from the Birmingham Coalition. I could be wrong, but if you guys think that this is a different one, please let me know using the hashtag Safari Live. Are you going to start calling again? You see the kill is just above on the tree and we can now definitely confirm and this might be a bit of a gruesome view for some so please look away now if you don't want to see something very raw but it is an impala a female impala that Tingana was feeding upon so now absolute confirmation as we can see the head of the of the impala and you see that she he managed to at least eat i would say half of it which is very good because now he's gonna have a little bit more food and probably fare a little bit better and just when we saw him the other day he was looking very skinny but i think the fact that now the um, conditions for the climate and the weather have also played in his favor he's managed to bring something bigger down which is great because we we would like because we want the impalas to die but because Tingana was in desperate need of something to eat. Now, he's still up on the tree, um, on the other tree Tingana, but he's still facing in this direction. So I think his plan is just to, or maybe he's just hoping for, he's just hoping for the lion to actually get bored and leave and go somewhere else. Perhaps we we'll give him enough of a gap so that he can go all the way up there. Now, he was scratching his his claws and by no means um, he's, he's not aware of the fact that the impala kill is up there on the tree but I think he also realized that it's not going to be the easiest thing for him to go up and he might slip so I think he's waiting not too sure if he's going to wait for the kill to fall off the tree or if he's actually just being clever enough to wait for the tree to dry a little bit and then he might just try because when we saw him scratching the tree earlier perhaps well certainly marking it for territorial purposes and I'm sure that was a very clear sign towards Tingana but I think he could have also been trying to see if he had any gription. Michael you say this is in Suku and not in Fumo. That would make more sense because Mfumo hasn't been seen and I think he's all the way on Malamala. But now okay maybe I should just just remember this car. Hmm. Oh, there we go. Gone down. Now, I wonder why you ended up here and the rest of your pride not. It's interesting with the Birminghams. They seem to split up just as much, or probably more than what they're actually spent with any of their pride. So there'll be one of them and then one of them and the other one comes. But in Suku, in the last few days, and it would make sense then that if this is him, has been the one that hasn't been with the Nkuhuma pride. So it could be that he's just been hanging around this area in general, or he's just been going in between prides, perhaps he's visited the Styx pride in the last little while. But I think pretty much given up, I don't think he's going to try and get up onto the kill at any time soon, unless Tingana manages to come down from the tree, in which, head, in which case I'm pretty sure he would pull up his head and at least gaze in that direction. But I think Tingana also got a very proper fright, so he's just up there and enjoying the morning. Well, I don't know if enjoying would be a good word for Tingana, but he's definitely braving it on top of the of the tree that he's in. Now, it seems like Byron is having a wonderful morning drinking coffee, so let's head on to him and see what he thinks of all this ordeal. Well, I am indeed, and um, Elliot's wonderful to see that sighting. I mean, it's funny though how often we see lion interacting with leopards. Uh, you know, we had those that coalition not too long ago last year we had a few sightings and tristan had a sighting recently too i think of lions climbing a tree to get a leopard kill out of the tree so it's amazing to see those big massive male lions up in trees and looking for for leopards meal um but uh, that's a fantastic sighting and not something you see all the time or very often so i'm glad ali did go out and it looks like she managed to find a great sighting for us. I'm sure Tristan might be a little bit jealous. I wonder. We'll have to ask him. Maybe after the show we'll ask him. Um, what else are we talking about? We're talking about Batelier. I think somebody had a question about the Batelier. And James Henry wanted to find, or wanted me to find the Latin name of the Batelier. Why is James asking all these questions? He must be very bored. Shame. Um, okay, well, James, the Batelier Terethopius Equidatus. 
echodatus, echodatus, Terithopius echodatus. That is the Batelier, Mr. Henry, and I hope you are well, Mr. Henry. And I'm trying to speak like James because he mocks me and my accent. Um, even though James comes from a part of Joburg not very far north of where I am from. But uh, anyway, James has always teased me about that. Um, I'm going to see if there's anything interesting sneaking around the tent. The rain is coming down again. You can actually see it dripping off the tent, uh, just off the side of the tent over there. Um, and I hope Tristan and Ali are managing to stay dry. But let's go back to Ali now and that wonderful sighting of that male lion and male leopard. Well, the male leopard is on the other tree, so we're going to try and have a closer look at the male lion. I can't believe how lucky we've been this morning out of nowhere. And I think it was actually thanks to Tristan, and I might give him all the credits for the sighting, that said to us that there was probably some action going on at Chitua. However, we didn't quite understand until we got here that it was both Tingana and one of the Birmingham boys at the sighting. So shows that teamwork is probably the best thing to do because then we'll do it for each other and we help each other out. Now I don't think there's any teamwork going on with the Birmingham's now and you see even when they're apart they're quite opportunistic themselves so they will it's not all for the greater good when it comes to lions it's also a very selfish um, society. So he's here he's not gonna call his brothers and just let him know let them know that there's a big kill uh, or a kill here up at the tree if it was a different situation perhaps a bigger kill then maybe he would try but for now it seems like he knows that this is not enough food for more than one lion although you look still quite full I don't think you're that you're that skinny are you gonna now go and hide in between the bushes that's even, that's gonna be wetter I wouldn't go there if I were you <laughs> what a morning you've had. I don't know if maybe he's now trying to hide himself a little bit more from Tingana, but I'm pretty sure Tingana can, can still see him from that tree because there's virtually nothing in between the tree where Tingana is and the Marula tree and where the lion is. And Tingana is also, he's been around for a while. This is not his first encounter with a lion and he knows how to act and how to protect himself. Hmm. There's, it's, it's also starting to drizzle a little bit and we know that male lions do not like getting their manes wet. So it's probably the reason why he's gone and hid in between the bushes. But I think probably you didn't realize that you had so many little branches there. Look at him, longingly looking at that kill. I want it. I want to eat it. Full. <laughs> you cannot, You almost feel p sorry for him with that very pathetic look in his eyes as in like, oh, but it's so far up. Shame. I almost feel sorry for you and I would feel sorry for you if I thought that this was your kill, but you didn't kill this. Somebody else did. Don't be a fatty. <laughs> Don't steal other animals' food. Now, <laughs> in more realistic terms, this does happen often. Animals and predators will scavenge from one another and it's part of the reason why they're so intolerant with each other, even with the cubs. So it is what the way that they've reacted, the male lion chasing the male leopard for its meal. It's not because this particular individual is meaner or, you know, has something against Ingana or anything else. Normally, this is the way that lions and leopards behave in the wild. Oh, are you roaring? Oh, now you want help. to talk in case he starts roaring again because that is my most favorite sound in the whole world it's a lion roaring it is 
the most powerful sound that there is out there and I think he started roaring now because he's getting frustrated he keeps looking up and I think he knows it's not gonna be easy for him to get up there so I wonder if he's perhaps trying to get some of his other brothers to come into the area and help him out or perhaps he's just and I think this is more the realistic option he's just making it known to Tingana that he is here and that he's actually claiming this particular kill it's all about communication and as i was saying earlier it is very common for both of them to have reacted that way now tingana is an older male leopard and we know that he hasn't had the, the easiest time in the last little while he's looking a little bit skinny it seems like he's on the men but still he's got to be very careful of other creatures moving around and by other creatures i mean other male leopards that might be around lions females and males and then of course hyenas and um I'm missing something and just <laughs> other creatures in general so this male lion over here has actually been very clever and just imagine this morning when we heard them roaring it, it wouldn't have surprised me that the ones that Byron and I heard from the tent were actually exactly like this one hiding in between the bushes which would which make it much, that much harder to actually try and spot them it's crazy his eyes are fixed on the kill you can start roaring again I'm gonna hope that it starts roaring again, but while I do that, let's head back to Tristan, see if he's had any other luck. No, no other luck, but I'm super glad that Ali managed to catch up with that male lion and see all of those dramatic events unfold. It's always amazing when you see all of those kind of things and the roaring as well is always very cool. I can't even remember the last time I had a male lion roaring next to me so very happy for Ali we actually knew about that male lion right from the quite early in the drive but unfortunately Rusty's comms there are not very good so I couldn't actually get anybody on the radio to even talk to them as to how to get into that sighting so it was a better idea to send Ali on Wendy and I'm glad it's all worked out because it seems as though she got there at the perfect time which is all very good news so happy days at least that's happening the only thing that's not good is if that is Tingana's kill that that lion is taking well that's never a good idea and I was hoping that Tingana would really get a good meal so a little sad if that is his kill that was stolen I don't really know the exact details of what happened there but hopefully Tingana will be able to find himself another meal the other thing that I was just thinking about which I've now has escaped to my head completely this is what happens when you, you get a bit older is that you start to forget things and I was had a really good point about something but it's all gone now and I actually for the life of me can't remember what I was about to tell you it's gone anyway we'll just carry on with what's going on oh that's I now I remember what I wanted to say I was going to say that it's something about Chitwa airstrip that is Tingana and kills in impala tree I mean impalas in in a tree and male lions that rob him. It's the second time that that's happened. Byron saw it last time and now Ali this time. Anyway, talking about Ali and the male lion, let's send you back across to him. Hopefully he'll roar once again and I'm sure it will be amazing. Perfect timing. Sorry, this sound is incredible, but just by looking at its face, it seems like it's also like a raging roar. As in like, he's upset to go away, he wants to get that kill from the tree, and this morning is just not going his way. <laughs> Almost seems like that's what he's feeling. He's looking a little bit on the grumpy side, not at us whatsoever, but I think it's just in general at the whole situation. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I think that that roaring of yours is just to make a statement to the world, to Tingana and to any other lion that might be around here. So it's, I think it's just wonderful when they roar. It's like I said earlier, the most powerful sound that there is out here. And it's just everything almost like vibrates all around us. And when a male lion roars, then you can definitely tell that they're the king of the jungles. Every, everything 
feels like we need to respect this male lion. And I think the rain is making him a little bit upset now. Where are you gonna go? Wonder if he's perhaps gonna try and scare Tingana off or if he's gonna try and make it up the tree. So I think now he's getting impatient. What you gonna do? If he does go up, we might yeah. go and do one of our, our unscheduled broadcasts. But I'm not too sure what he's gonna do. I think he doesn't quite know what he's gonna do just yet. We do know that he's hungry, that's for sure. And it's almost like this prize is being dangled on top of him. But he doesn't have access. Are you going to lay, lie down again, boy? <laughs> He's making so many noises. He's so grumpy. And I don't know if any of you have ever owned a cat. It's, it's just the behavior. It's just identical to when a cat gets angry. You know, it's that look. It's just like, feed me now. Shame. You haven't chosen the best spot, but I must say, at least it's good for shelter and you're not getting wet because there, there's a bit of a, more of a drizzle coming down now. Are you going to roar again? I think maybe we'll get lucky with the third roar. Hmm. I don't think he's going to roar just yet, but hopefully in the next few minutes he will. We'll keep you guys posted. But in the meantime, we're going to send you across to Byron and the tent. Now, I agree with Ali. It is one of the most amazing things to hear in the bushes, that beautiful roar of a lion. And it, uh, I've been very fortunate to hear lions roaring and, and a number of males together. We've had coalitions in the Sabi Sands, four, five lions together at times, the Majingalan and the Mapojo lions. I've seen both those coalitions a lot down in the southern part or central part of the Sabi Sands. And having all of them roar together is just absolutely unbelievable now i'm um, just quickly with all this rain obviously there's a lot of water and water droplets now i know james henry i think uh, not james henry sorry was it james richard sorry james richard you asked them um, about um a water droplet in the microscope and i've managed to get a beautiful water droplet have a look there's actually something inside that water droplet that's swirling around i wonder if you can see that maybe a, a few little particles trapped inside that water droplet and um, you can see the hairs on the grass blade very very clearly i'm going to you can see my reflection as i move the reflection obviously changes let me look at that isn't that beautiful um i'm just going to try to change this slightly because there's another little droplet further down look at that little one you can see the lights of the tent that is really, really wonderful, magnificent. And I mean, this blade of grass, I cannot see those hairs on the blade of grass with the naked eye, um, but very, very clear on the microscope, and these tiny little water droplets from this wonderful rain that we're having. Well, it's been, uh, it's been a bit of a, an interesting morning. We try to keep it as interesting as possible in the tent, but um, I'm sure the tent will be here again this afternoon. We'll be in here. Um, I think let's go back to Ali. She's still with that beautiful male lion and leopard, and uh, she's going to end off the show. Right. Well, we are still hoping that he might decide to get up and go up the tree, but I'm not too sure if that's actually even looking promising at this point in time. He is frustrated and I'm sure he wants to get up there just to finish the kill because it seems to be a little bit of meat left, definitely all of the neck and some ribs. So I wouldn't be surprised if he's just being greedy now. You are looking pretty though, boy. Very nice. And thank you so much for roaring. We actually really thoroughly enjoyed that. Hmm. It's almost like it's got a little house in there with all the fallen off branches and the <laughs> it's a perfect little place 
Now, I wonder if he's actually given up for now, because every time I've said that, it seems like it's the right time for him to get moving. Hmm. Now, it's, it has actually been a very wonderful drive. I know Byron and I had a wonderful time just <laughs> trying to get our Latin right, which is normally a challenge, but we had a lot of fun trying to learn it. And I was, we were both actually very impressed with all of Tristan's knowledge about frogs and frog calls. I think he got both Byron and myself there, and he definitely knows a few more than what we do. And then obviously coming down here and then just being able to see all of this unfold in action on some of the characters that have actually been missing from us in the last few days. Because Tingana has been pretty much everywhere but we haven't seen him that much because he's been trying to lie low and then and then and Suku hasn't been with the Inkahuma Pride every time that we've managed to find them. So it's good to see that they're both still okay, although a bit a bit of a nervous wrecking moment with both of them moving around. But now at least we know where to start looking for them this afternoon, which is going to be just fantastic. And hopefully we'll be able to keep up with both of them and see what they've been going on. But for now, it's time for us to say goodbye and head to breakfast. And we'll see you all on this afternoon.